The yes, sir. Sixteen twenty one Forest has been deferred. Okay. No more changes. We have a motion to approve agenda. So moved. All right. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Uh, are there uh, any uh, councilmen that would like to speak before we get into it? Okay. Seeing none. Um, do we have a motion to approve last month's meeting minutes? So moved. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Approved. Okay. Um, public hearing for each case. There will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They re may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. Um, and as we always say, that's eight minutes of your presentation. You can leave up to two minutes or less for your rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they're representing an organization or group, and they may have five minutes. And we have the handy counter clock right there so you can get an idea of where you are as far as finishing um, your um, the idea you wanted to make sure you present to us. All right, appeals. Uh, appeals to the decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Pursuant to the provision of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via statutory writ of certiorari. You're advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Uh, next, we have the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Okay, first we have 719 Shelby Avenue. This is new construction, it's revision of an infill. Um, zero Murphy Road, new construction, it's an infill, 2709 Belmont Boulevard. And we have reviewed all of these and recommend approval. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions about anything on the consent agenda? Okay, open public hearing. Would anyone like to say anything about any of the projects on the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion to approve? Um, second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. So the first one on the list with the after the deferral is 412 Broadway. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would like to um, recuse myself, uh, uh, recuse myself from this um, uh, because I have a very close personal relationship with the owners of the property. Okay, duly noted. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, 412 Broadway has added wall and painted signs to the rooftop addition, the front and sides respectively without permit. The design guidelines allow for two square feet of signage per linear foot of street facade. Uh, therefore, with the building's 42 uh, linear feet on Broadway, it is promoted 84 square feet for signage. The projecting sign seen here installed in 2001 is 60 um, 0.3 square feet, uh, leaving 23 and change. Um, the n recently installed sign added to the front facade of the addition here is nine feet by four and a half, which is a total of 40.5 square feet. Uh, therefore, it exceeds the allowed sign area by 16.8. Section four uh, of signage also states that a wall sign shall be located lower than the window sills of the top floor for multi-story buildings, and that no portion of a wall sign uh, should extend above the roof line or above a parapet wall of a building with a flat roof. And therefore, the sign does not meet the guidelines for its location either. Uh, the painted sign on the side of the addition uh, is permitted uh, up to 125 square feet. The exact dimensions of what's been put up is not known, uh, but the applicant has told staff uh, that it is more than 125 square feet. The uh, the other the location and the design are um, appropriate per the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the wall sign, with the condition that it be removed within 30 days, uh, and approval of the painted sign, with the conditions that the paint is not metallic, fluorescent, or day glow. That staff review drawings with its dimensions, and that the uh, 
overall size is not to exceed 125 square feet. <coughs> and the applicant is here to answer your questions as well. Okay, thank you. Is um, anyone having questions for Paul? Paul, just to be clear, so what um, the wall sign would be the one in the front and the painted sign is the one on the left side? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, would the applicant like to come forward and state your name and address? <clears throat> My name is Brad Sanderson with The Stage on Broadway. Uh, my address is 412 Broadway, Nashville, Tennessee, 37203. I am the co-owner of the business as well as the president of the corporation. Um, with both of these two potential violations we're talking about today, uh, I wasn't trying to skirt or violate any law. Uh, I think most government officials that know my family and our businesses, they would speak very highly of us and our record would show that we always follow codes. Um, I had a friend paint a mirror on the side of a building and I, and I myself hung a neon sign on the rooftop deck. I'm not asking for forgiveness for doing something that I knew I wasn't supposed to do. I'm basically just asking for your permission. I do have uh, a few quick comments to make about each one of them. Would you prefer we separate the two items or should I just make all my comments at once? Um, I guess if you, you mean separate as far as the wall hung or the painted? Correct, I have oh. like a couple minutes pertaining to each of them. Oh, I think that's great. Okay, uh, concerning this uh, neon deck sign, uh, the 30-foot setback and the 15-foot height above parapet rule uh, is specifically meant for these new third-floor additions that everybody's doing downtown to not change the appearance, the historic appearance of the front of the building and the facade itself. The 42-inch the, the deck railing set back eight feet. That set back's the same reason you get your line of sight and you, uh, and you can't see the addition so it doesn't change the building. So um, there's a, the second photo on the sheet, the front of the sheet you have there. Um, this is a picture from across the street uh, of the front of the building. You can see that the third story, the deck railing, and the sign in question can't be seen when standing across Broadway. However, the sign itself, it does improve the ambience when you're on the deck, but it clearly cannot be seen. It's the whole point of the historic setback. Um, in the middle of page five on the staff's recommendations, it states, in the past, the commission has not considered a rooftop addition in the calculation of height or top floor in regards to signage. So basically this wall doesn't apply to signage square footage. So therefore it would seem to me like a, the existing signage code doesn't apply to this sign. It's a sign that's set back 30 feet and, uh, and uh, is not visible from the street, no different than I had mounted the sign inside of a window. Uh, some businesses like me have a stucco wall, some have mostly glass, some have no wall at all, such as the new and like, uh, like Nudie's for example, and it was passed as well, they have no front wall at all. And I would assume them hanging a sign underneath their roof would really be no different than me. I just happened to chose stucco as the front. So that's basically all I have to say about the, uh, about the front sign. I'm sorry, you keep going, but I will stop. You just, let's go and do the next one. Go, we'll, go ahead and talk yeah. about the mural as well? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry if I'm. All right, so for, um, concerning the mural, uh, the first pair of photos I've given you on the second page of the handout um, are ones taken from the adjacent rooftop while another one standing on Broadway beside, <clears throat> beside Bridgestone Arena. Um, as Mr. Hoffman mentioned earlier, this, the, the staff has already Im informed me that they will approve a mural if it's under 125 square feet. So the logo aspect of that's advertising my business is under that. It's 102 square feet. However, the artwork as a whole is more than double that, actually. It's 350 square feet. Um, as large as that does sound, it only takes up 16% of the 2,200 square foot wall it's painted on. Um, code states that mu murals usually should be under 125 square feet. I believe that the point of saying usually is to prevent businesses from just simply painting a giant billboard on the side of a building advertising their business. 
Um, if you quickly look at the very last page, it's a close-up view of it. It's, it's a beautifully done mural, and the, the aspects that, with the instruments and the Nashville and the Music City is taking up more than twice as much areas as my own logo is. Uh, the artists even age the mural to make it blend in with the surrounding ones that you could see on each side of it, pretty visible ones for Tomcats, ones for Tootsies, so it would blend in with everything else. Um, I personally, I don't feel like this mural is any way degrades the historical look of downtown. I didn't go way overboard on advertising the aspect of the business and that. So um, basically, I just ask that I hope you guys would agree. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. And you can save two minutes for rebuttal if afterward. But before you do, any questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, open public hearing. Uh, would anybody like to say anything regarding this project? Okay. All right. Looks like uh, we're fine. We'll call you if we have any questions for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Close public hearing. Discussion. Well, I, I you know, we have set some standards for signage downtown and I think anything that we make exception to sort of opens up a, another issue for us. So I think we need to be very, very careful in how we actually uh, approach uh, these two signs. I'll echo that. Um, I was actually on the, one of the members of many from the community who came together to create the signage mm -hmm. guidelines, which were a combination of compiling not only for the historic district, but as, as a whole downtown signage guidelines that not only apply in, in um, the historic district, but sort of throughout um, Nashville. And, and so I, I think this, this isn't the first, nor will it be the last with respect to signage that it, it, it's um, a bit of an arms race when it, when it comes to drawing the attention of, of um, tourists and, and residents alike to go to one place versus the next. And, and, I, and I think that the line was drawn in a particular place, whether that's the right place or not, I, I don't know, but certainly the line was, was or the, the, the total calculation had to be made somewhere, and, and, and I, I think uh, to the extent that we can interpret those guidelines and the way they were intended is is our duty here. Well, I'd like to also add, I know as the the more and more additions that we get to the rooftops, which I know that we are have to be very, very careful, I think, um, Robin, we've been sort of given a, I don't know whether you would call it a warning, but just a reminder that if we approve too many of these and make too many exceptions that we, it, we are jeopardizing our historic designation for the area. So. I think that plays into, we make an exception for one, we've got others that might be approved, and this just sets an exa another example. So it, it, I, I agree with Ben well, where we stand. I'll yeah. add to that, you take, take out that this is an existing building now with new facade. Um, take that out of the argument. There, there was discussion when the signage guidelines were established that if you have a single tenant building that might at some point be multi-tenant or vice versa, it's up to the building owner to kind of manage the total amount of signage so that you don't max out and then suddenly, well, I've got a third tenant who's, they need their presence as well, that that was considered as we were putting together the, the guidelines both for new construction, which would also apply to existing construction. I don't know that that necessarily applies specific to this case because it's an existing building, but that the, gui the guidelines weren't just made in a vacuum of, uh, of multi-tenancy or, or future additions or any of those number of things. I think the intent, um, both of the guidelines, the intent of signage is that they be viewed and located appropriately to, to draw a business as viewed from the street. With, with multi-users uh, or, or occupants, um, and we've held pretty strictly to the, the establishment of, of the guidelines. So. The only thing I'll add is I, um, when I was first looking at it, I was thinking, oh, you really don't see the stage from the street, but um, the actual second page that shows um, 
the part that's painted on, you see more, now I do see the actual um, stage sign that uh, the, the illuminated one. So, I, so it does it does show up more. Um, I have less, um, although it's outside the guidelines, the less of an issue with the painted one. But I, you know, I do like you guys have been saying we do have our um, requirements. But you know, that would be the only one that I, I would like. Staff said I'd agree with keeping it. Maybe if if it can be reduced or make sure it's not illuminated anyway. But that one is less to me than the illuminated one. It's certainly a beautiful piece of art. It certainly is. So I, I appreciate the applicant being here and, and presenting the case. I, I agree with my colleagues that um, um, contrary to, to that picture right across the street, this, both these signs are highly visible from the street. When you go up the street, you're not directly across from them. So, uh, you know, we've run into this a number of times before and have been pretty consistent about uh, staying with the guidelines that were approved by the district. Um, and so I, I move for a disapproval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, next one is 122nd Avenue South. Mr. Chair, point of clarification on the last one. I think the staff was, um, it was a motion for disapproval, but the staff had recommended approval on the uh, uh, allowing sign. the painted right, sign. I, I just wanted to make sure there was some clarity in, in direction for both the staff and the applicant. I appreciate yeah. that, Ben. Good That's good. true. Um, do I, do we need to do a new motion, or can we just make that? Can I make that clarification that we are just going to go with staff recommendations? Okay. Yeah, does that that staff recommendation is is that they are going to to reduce this? They're whatever gonna, part of that artwork and so that it does not exceed 125. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 122nd Avenue South. Uh, this application at 122nd Avenue South uh, is a follow-up on a six-story infill building that was approved first in 2015, and then revisions were approved by the commission in 2017. The request before you today is a proposal to clad portions of the building uh, exterior walls with material that has not been approved as of yet by the Historic Zoning Commission. Uh, what's not changed from the original approval, or at least from the revised plan earlier this year is the front facade. Uh, the front facade is to have stone on the first story and the mezzanine, brick facade on the third, fourth, and fifth stories. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't clear in the previous approval, but um, just so it's clear now, the sixth story is to be clad with a exterior insulation and finish system, an EFIS, which is essentially stucco applied over foam backer. Uh, the texture and color of that six-story EFIS will be made to resemble stone. Uh, staff finds that the visibility and impact of EFIS in this six-story location is minimal because of the height, visibility, uh, lack of visibility, et cetera. And therefore, it finds that application of it to be appropriate. On the left facade, there will also uh, be EFIS mimicking stone, uh, again, on the sixth story, and then also at the um, uh, freeze band at the, the mezzanine uh, with brick on the third through fifth stories, as on the front. The lower walls here, uh, at least as the drawings are labeled, uh, the lower walls are to be clad with an EFIS with a brick patterned finish. Uh, and that is the new material that we're reviewing today. Uh, and then over to the right elevation, also stucco, <coughs> stone textured EFIS on six story and, and the freeze. And then brick patterned EFIS to be used there on the third, fourth, and fifth stories. Uh, section 3F2 of the guidelines say uh, they do allow for contemporary, or the guidelines do allow for co contemporary materials if they protect possess characteristics similar in the scale, design, finish, texture, durability, and detailing of historic materials. Uh, so 
we wanted to review the proposed material and uh, determine if it, if it met that design guideline. So we did that by looking at uh, six characteristics of the material. Um, appearance, functionality, availability, availability of craftspersons, safety and sustainability, and cost of the new compared to historic materials. Um, so we'll start with appearance, of course. Here are uh, our photos, uh, the one on the right I took, the one on the left was given by uh, Ms. Stigler, um, of brick patterned ephus um, taken in a you know, close view. And this is of a ephus wall uh, on 8th Avenue near the office uh, taken just from just from the side of the building. And our determination based on photos and material samples provided by the applicant down here on the floor and uh, looking at the building in, in situ was that it does not really look sufficiently like brick. Uh, even mass produced brick uh, is essentially clay that's been fired and installed uh, unit, um, masonry units, uh, modular units by hand. Uh, and as such, uh, has a lot of variation in the color of individual bricks and in the orientation in how they get laid. Uh, the EFIS material is much more hom homogeneous surface, flat surface. Uh, it, um, the foam backing uh, of the substrate also has limitations in size, which results in joints or expansion seams in the surface, which are very evident in, in that photo. Uh, and so I find that those characteristics, the features of, of the EFIS material are not typical of historic brick, which again, the guidelines would require uh, a new material to have. Um, here are a few examples sent by the applicant. There are more in your recommendation packets. Uh, here's a photo of EFIS brick. Now this also has the EFIS stone material, which uh, is smoother, you know, and resembles stone a little bit more closely than the brick, faux brick does for brick. Uh, there also are expansion seams. Uh, more from the applicant, uh, expansion seams, and again, the, the flat homogeneous surface. Uh, it doesn't really replicate brick all that well. Uh, so we felt that it did, did not meet the criteria, our criteria uh, for appearance. Functionality, uh, staff's opinion that the durability and workability of the material is very different from brick as well. Uh, obviously brick is very durable. It's ubiquitous throughout the downtown neighborhood. It's been used in Nashville for nearly if not over 200 years, and you know, likewise, the rest of the world. Uh, EFIS being a newer material, uh, its durability is certainly not as well established. Uh, the, the manufacturer, the, the Drive It brand, provides a 30-year guarantee. Um, also in terms of repairability, brick is low maintenance, nothing in the world is no maintenance, but brick is easily repaired, repointed if needed, um, individual bricks can be replaced. Uh, the repairability of EFIS is, at least hasn't been pre presented to us, so it's not well understood, but um, certainly it can't just be replaced piece by piece. It's a, a different process altogether. Uh, availability of, so we felt it was didn't meet our standard of functionality. Um, availability of historic materials, obviously if a historic, or historically appropriate material is unavailable, then a substitute material, of course, would be appropriate. Brick is very available, uh, and so we felt that that didn't meet that criteria. Likewise, if you can obtain a material but no one to install it, then it wouldn't be uh, feasible to require that material to be used, and therefore a substitute material would be appropriate, but masons are uh, commonly available in town, so it didn't meet that criteria. Safety and sustainability, uh, that is something like uh, historically some materials like lead, um, asbestos were used, which are not safe to use now. We know they are not safe to use nowadays, 
BRIC doesn't have those concerns uh, that we are aware of, so we felt that there wasn't a necessity for allowing substitute materials uh, as a regard for safety and sustainability. And similarly, cost, um, if, if a historic or appropriate material were prohibitively expensive, then its use w should, wouldn't need to be, or we wouldn't require its, its use over a substitute material. Here, uh, we don't feel that those concerns, uh, at least have not been demonstrated. Uh, summing up, staff did not find that the brick patterned EFIS met any of the criteria that would demonstrate that it is an appropriate substitute for brick. Staff recommends approval of the smooth finished EFIS on the sixth floor and trim and disapproval of custom brick EFIS, finding that it does not meet the section 3F2 of the design guidelines for the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Uh, the samples are here on the floor. I can pass them around or I can hold them up and the applicant is here and they have some, uh, looks like they have some more samples they may want to show. Just for um, clarity, can you go back to the image that shows the part that's um, not approved and approved again? Um, I, go, yeah. Uh, the, the elevation? Yeah, yeah, those things, yeah. So we'll, that's we'll the right elevation. The brick, yeah. the red is, I didn't mean red in the red light, green light, good, bad kind of thing, just because red, because it's brick. But that's where the, the EFIS is to be used. Uh, the six story brick there was not labeled. Uh, I assume that would have, it could have been EFIS as well, but obviously that's the same brick pattern. And um, now the left side, this is how this one was labeled uh, to be EFIS on the mezzanine level uh, with true brick on the uh, third, fourth, and fifth stories. Um, again, that was, I didn't really elaborate here, but in the staff recommendation, that was one of our comments as well, is that you have a transition of, of true brick on the front facade, second, or the third, fourth, and fifth, and then when you move to the right elevation, that would be a faux brick on the side. We weren't sure if that, it, you know, how that transition would have been managed. It was another reason why staff was recommending disapproval. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Sean, can, can you provide some clarity, at least for me, as to what the status, I know you just reviewed it there, what the status of the application, the approved application is, um, I don't remember this case. So I, um, where Where is real brick and where is not real brick in not this, this um, discounting the application today or the amendment to the application that we're considering, can you um, tell us what we approved? So our April 19, 2017 approval was recommended for approval with conditions that the right wall shall be bricked to match the rest of the building. Um, that would be that wall, yeah. Um, that condition didn't, well, it didn't specify, but um, I think I wrote that recommendation and I assumed that that was brick since the th second or the yeah third, fourth, and fifth was, was all brick. In the application, were these materials called out as different? Um, yeah, the labeling was, it's... Yeah, there, there are, do you have the, I don't have the full elevation on my recommendation, or in the presentation, but the recommendation does. Um, yeah, there are 50 some materials labeled, so I may have missed. No, just the, I'm curious, uh, neither, neither, you know, the, and the rear of the building is facing an alley and not part of our consideration. It, it, it seems like this would be a in total we're asking for a like kind complete substitution is part of the application for today. Is that accurate? I think that's an accurate way to okay. describe it. Whether or not the EFIS is, uh, should be introduced at all. Brick pattern EFIS, that is. Be, and, and beyond the EFIS at the sixth floor, which was specifically mentioned in the application and in the approval. Correct, yeah. Right. 
Thank you. Okay. Any more questions for Sean? Okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, is the cap applicant here would like to come forward and um, please state your name and address? Mark Robin, 309 Terry Trace, and I did. There's a quick turnaround between comments and our chance, so I did bring today a sample that's, we were thinking about maybe using an even tone brick. We haven't asked for this yet, but that's why you've got even tone. We just saying this means you can talk in the microphone? Yes, yeah, so I've already today show that you can make whatever, you know what I mean? The one you make is whatever you want to make, basically. <coughs> Okay, again, I brought a sample that's more variated uh, because originally we were hoping to use a more even tone brick, but now getting the comments in the short turnaround, we brought something that we think would be more uh, addressed your concerns. The Secretary of the Department of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties with guidelines is the benchmark, the gold standard for preserving, rehabilitating, restoring, and reconstructing historic buildings. Just this year in 2017, uh, it has been updated to incorporate the most recent advancement in historic preservations. National guidelines for the Broadway Historic District were first established February 2007 and were based on the federal guidelines in 2007. Although updated in the previous years, national guidelines have not been revised to reflect the most recent federal guidelines. A lot has changed in design and construction since 2007 with historic buildings we can do today what we could not do 10 years ago. The 2017 federal document, the Bible for Historic Pre District Guidelines, allows more options than the older guidelines. The federal guidelines do mention and allow ethos, and I want to quote now from the new guidelines. Quote, over the years, Im imitative materials have increased in variety as synthetic materials can continue to be introduced, including a substitute, an exterior insulation and finish system, EFIS, for another imitative material, stucco. Imitative materials are also used to recreate missing or deteriorated architectural features in historic buildings. So it's fair to say the Secretary of the Department of Interior's guidelines allows EFIS. This acceptance of EFIS is the reason we are here seeking your approval to use a new EFIS product called Custom Brick, developed for use in buildings. Even though EFIS is allowed, there are many reasons this newly developed material is more appropriate than traditional brick for where and how we prepare to use it. It provides not only feasible constructability, but also better helps to meet the modern energy requirements that new buildings must possess. Most importantly is the increase in public safety. Custom brick does not give, change, does not give cause for cities to institute retuck laws to protect pedestrians from under-maintained brick that falls. Uh, in addition to the lot's unique interior location and size, the soils in our site consist of fill material from previous structures all the way down to the bedrock, 15 to 17 feet below. Now, if the lot went block to block, we could remove all this bad soil down to the bedrock, and then we'd have good ground to build up with underground parking. But it doesn't. And if we were to remove the soils, property line to property line, then the two neighboring buildings' foundations would fail. So we must hold back a minimum of 10 feet and cannot disturb that area of ground. This restriction results in a cantilever footing that can invade the restricted area, taking the exterior wall to the property line. Being cantilevered, the weight it can hold is much less than if it was not cantilevered. So a modern material of complementary color, size, texture, and scale of brick that weighs 1 35th, 1 35th the weight of conventional brick makes this condition buildable. <clears throat> there was some confusion. So it is important to, to note that this request is not for the front facade that faces Second Avenue where traditional brick is proposed. It's not even for the rear facade where again traditional brick is being proposed. And said the EFIS custom brick is being requested only for use on the two side elevations above the adjacent existing structures. The traditional brick on the front and rear elevations, they turn the corner two foot eight inches onto the side elevations. Then the plane of the custom brick, it's set back four inches from the outside face of the brick. 
So it would be difficult to see the sides of the building, particularly on the right side, which is blocked by the four-story boot company building, and more so by the bridge adjacent to the boot building. On the left side, the neighbor building is shorter than the adjacent buildings that would reach, it's, it's, but as the uh, other buildings reach toward Broadway, they are taller. So this site context restricts the visibility of the side elevations to a very small opportunity, resulting in no appreciable visual impact on the district. This restriction for the restriction from the Nashville guidelines was before custom brick existed. Custom brick does possess characteristics similar in scale, design, finish, texture, durability, and detailing to historic materials and meets the newest 2017 Department of Interior standards. In conclusion, you're being asked to approve the custom brick because EFIS is recognized in the most recent federal guidelines. It's a modern material converting a, a complement complementary color, size, texture, and scale of brick that weighs 1 35th the weight of conventional brick, making it possible to build in certain contexts in our oldest urban core historic district. It's a modern material complementary color, size, texture, and scale of brick, but it increases the energy performance of the building. It's a modern material complementary color, size, texture, and scale of brick that decreases the maintenance versus conventional brick while increasing the safety of the public. It is a modern material comp complementary color, size, texture, and scale of brick, but due to the site's particular location, its use has no real visible impact on the district. Now, prior to the updating of the Secretary of Interiors, EFAS was being used in acceptable manners in historic buildings in many U.S. cities. To further speak on this matter, we have invited today with us a nationally recognized build building consultant who is involved in the development of custom brick and has acceptance in historic buildings throughout the United States, John Powers. Sorry for being so fast, but the time's limited. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is John Powers. My address is 3393 West 700 South, Rushville, Indiana. I'm the National Technical Director for Drive It. I've been in the industry for 37 years uh, to address some of the, the concerns. Uh, obviously, EFS, when a lot of the communities have had reluctance to use it, it was based upon a barrier assembly. The assemblies that are used today are consistent with the recently adopted energy code for the state of Nashville, which is the 2012 IECC. It's inclusive of the air, the water, the vapor, the thermal, and that's exactly what's being proposed for uh, this facility. In addition to that, the custom brick is basically just exactly as the name alludes to. It can be any color, texture, combination. Uh, even the grout can be modified to match existing. So to maintain auth historic authenticity, it typically can be managed by just providing a sample for matching purposes. EFS systems themselves, uh, you know, to address some of the comments, uh, the standard warranty is for 10 years. However, there are guidelines that you can maintain the warranty on that forever. All products, including brick, are basically tested for a 50-year weatherization. The products for EFS are exactly the same. So there's no differences there whatsoever. Uh, I think the real key here is, as Mark pointed out, is it appropriate for the building and ultimately maintain historic authenticity? And I think the key in this case is once you determine exactly what color, texture, uh, of both the grout and the, uh, the brick itself, then a sample could be provided to, to demonstrate that. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have and happy to do so now. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for the applicant? I, I do have one on the um, testing for EFS and, and maybe even more specifically on custom brick. What's, tell us, talk a little bit about color fastness over that lifespan and, and how um, some of these darker reds perform over over that time or, or what, what the, I don't, I don't know the industry term, for, but basically it fades, especially the deeper a color, whether it be metal or anything else, those, those things are going to weather in a different way than lighter yeah, colors. Yeah, great question. I think typically... And actually, if I could interrupt, my question is very similar to that, okay. but a little bit different. You can okay. address it at the same time, sure. which is that, you know, I, I have also, um, in fact, one of the pictures that the applicant showed was from Vanderbilt where we used this mm -hmm. brick for a screen wall uh, on a real brick building. 
And as time has gone on, the matching of that has degraded with the EFIS getting lighter and lighter, the brick getting darker and darker. So could you address yeah. that? Great. Both questions are very appropriate. The, just much like uh, moisture drainage assemblies that's code mandated for all claddings today, there's new technology for pigmentation. An example of that's called stratitone. That stratitone can give you the most color fast uh, appearance, longevity of any pigment that's available in the market and that's inclusive, you know, that includes brick. Generally, your reds, which most people are concerned about, aren't the ones that really fade. You're gonna have the blues, the yellows, the greens are much more prone. And that's, you know, commonly known in pigmented type of products. But ultimately, if there is a color that would be chosen for a specific project that could be fade, then the recommendation would be to use the new innovative pigmentation called stratitone with those particular colors, which would increase your longevity of that color itself. There's no way to project, you know, in advance you pick the color, then they can pretty much project how long that color is going to last before you start to see a drift. Generally what you'll see in, in most, uh, most areas of the country is the environmental pollution and dirt, environmental dirt. And so really when you detail a building to reduce the surface tension, that's gonna keep the building cleaner and actually increase your longevity of your appearance of your building. So I think that's probably the most appropriate thing. But bottom line, I would suggest that stratitone pigments be used to give the longest anticipated life performance of that coloring. Is there a marked increase in cost between kind of standard or, and then the addition of it, It's very items? minimal. But, but recognize the technology, uh, you know, 2007 wasn't available, but today it is, and that's worldwide. So when it's appropriate, as a manufacturer, we recommend that that, that proprietary pigment be used. The last question I have is maybe for the applicant, is what uh, Sean um, illustrated as the area, is that consistent with what you're saying? Is that any different? I'm, I was confused too. The real brick is on the front and back and turns onto the side. And then from there, it's, it's the brick on that third, fourth, and fifth floor, that's the custom brick actually. So the, the color should have been up higher to so this, the third, fourth, and fifth floor. Okay, so this area that's gray, for lack of a better color, yes, that's, <laughs> that, that's also the yes, stucco brick. Yes, sir. Okay, and then also the area below, too, the... Below uh, the band, yes, sir. All that, okay. Like an infill panel that would look like a brick infill All panel. All that. And and could you go back to that last one, too, Sean, um, just so we can make sure we're all clear. So the same thing here, this gray area, it's a stucco brick? Yes, sir. That's okay. correct. All right, and since you brought that up, I wanted to make sure we were clear on it. Yes, sir. It's all, all right. Yeah. Any more questions? I, I have a simple one. It, it might be sure. just really, really simple, but in terms of listening to how you're developing this building, to have the front and the back original brick, but then having this EFIS on the side, left and right. So what was your decision in not keeping it brick? The fact that we had to cantilever the footing means that the weight that we can put on those two in those two end walls, we need to reduce the weight to do that because of, of the neighboring buildings and the nature of the soils. It's all built terrible fill material. We're actually having to use micro piles that drop all the way down 17 feet and not even on the top of the rock is weather. We gotta go down into the bedrock. So it's a matter of coming up with something that's buildable and feasible that, that economical that works due to the nature of the soil. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, I, you know, I, I know what you're saying. We're not, we're saying the cost is not between brick and dry. The cost is what we'll have to do structurally. You can build anything. So what we would right. have to do structurally, if we had brick on those two side walls, that's going to be a lot of money extra to hold that 35 times the weight. Okay. Thank you. But it is existing. The original brick is existing. This is on a uh, parking lot. New construction. Oh. This is on a parking lot. It's new construction. Uh, so for the proposed EFIS brick, is there any public access from either the adjacent properties to that? So so no danger of damage from, you know, people picking at it and that kind of stuff? Uh, the danger is more so right now, the building next door, the brick is, was falling. They were trying to do something inside, the brick was falling onto our lot. And to be honest with you, I don't know how they got this, but they, I guess they got permission. They sprayed gun knife on the exterior wall. So there's is a, but 
Uh, no, the only brick that would fall of our building would be on the, on the alley or at Second Avenue. Otherwise, unless you're on the roof of the building, of course. But right, that's an advantage of the Ethos product, but it's not a factor that we were looking for. It's more, we have more of the weight that we can put on the exterior side walls is limited without a very high additional cost to the project. Okay. Did you want to make one final statement? Okay. Um, well, all right. I would like to say this as a compromise. If for some reason you don't like the brick, I think if we could use the Ethos stucco product, okay, that would be acceptable weight. You know, weight wise, we can we can handle that. All right. Let's we'll get to our discussion and we'll yes, we'll see where we end up. Thank you very much. Um, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay. Seeing no public hearing, discussion. Maybe you guys don't lolly back and back just in case we need you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Can the staff to back up one to the front facade? Or two? Yep. Okay. Thanks. I'll ask um, on the federal guidelines that he um, it is um, he um, quoted in his. Uh, pr presentation is that something that just hasn't been adopted, or do you can you describe? Can yeah, you is, um? Is he noted that it has been approved as a substitute for stucco, not for brick? And you've approved it as a substitute for stucco, and you've approved it on this building as a substitute for stone because it was up so high. But I don't know of any historic overlays. There may be, I don't know, that have allowed it for brick. We didn't look at it from that perspective. We looked at what was appropriate here for this project here in Nashville. And I also heard, too, that it was uh, imitated materials for stucco. It didn't take a break. Okay. Thanks. What would be the reaction of staff of, of using stucco instead of, of the brick? We, we actually um, offered that to the applicant, but they wanted to ask you for the brick. Um, I agree with s staff's... Um, what did he write? Unusually, unnaturally homogenous and flat on a large surface. I definitely agree with that. I, I don't think the, the EFIS brick is appropriate. Um, as far as the weight of the building, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of several sites downtown, you know, that have gone, you know, one example, four and a half stories down into what used to be the Kane Sloan department building that was imploded on itself, completely adjacent on two sides to two of Nashville's oldest churches, it can be done. Um, and so I just, I don't think it's an appropriate material for, for Second Avenue uh, downtown. Um, and I think it's a question of $10 per square foot versus $25 a square foot. I think, or I guess one argument I'll make in, in favor of masonry um, is that, you know, staff pointed out that we have 200-year-old buildings, you know, some of them so did, some have been cleaned more frequently than others, but as a material, the masonry um, is very durable and, and long-lasting. Um, the applicant brought up some good points about um, creating building envelopes that are, you um, higher performing than, you know, solid masonry wall would be, which was uh, of its own time and, and place. I, I think the use of brick doesn't preclude you f necessarily from um, from creating a similar performance. E even in a veneered wall, you, you can achieve some of the things. Granted, it's more difficult. You're, they have a fixed lease or a fixed lot area, and, and, and the more you creep into that, sudden, certainly the more they have to take that into account. But that's that's not necessarily of our of our concern um, as the building envelope would shrink if you if you put the essentially rigid insulation in the cavity of, of the masonry, which can also be done, whether it's a good idea for this building or not, I don't know, but um, the maintenance of long-term maintenance to, despite our, our best efforts and the, and the best technology that we can put forth in pigmentation, I, I think Brick has a exceedingly long track record and one of the um, applicants photographs I, I drive by in the morning and in the evening every day as I see it and, and, and I don't it wasn't initially intended um, I think it was initially intended as, as a masonry project but 
they ran into some other equally <laughs> poor souls that, that ca caused that transition, or at least that's what I understand from the builder. And, and, and I, I think when you hand over the keys, it, 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 it certainly has an appearance that, that could be viewed as acceptable, but I, I wonder over time um, what, how do you maintain this? Because it, you, you scaffold the whole thing to put it up and it's this netting of, uh, of things that, that goes on there. And when you apply it, it, it's a surface application and you almost like pull a sticker off to reveal the, the white behind it, which is one way to do it. And that's certainly faster than, I, I mean, it's almost like in architecture school, we were required to paint individual bricks on like a rendering with watercolors and do these individual washes. I can only imagine somebody out there main, maintaining this to provide the appropriate amount of variegation across a project as, as time goes by, and it just doesn't seem equivalent to me in, in terms of uh, its location here in a historic district where it's compared to other brick, not necessarily its appropriateness for some other place in, at some other site that, that is not in a historic district. So generally, um, you're okay with the uh, EFIS, just kind of, but just maybe not the brick because of the way it, um, the color. The imitation of something else in this particular sense, I, I think EFIS has proven its capabilities to, to imitate stone and some detailing that would be very difficult to achieve in this day and age. Um, and there were some, I think, that would argue that it, it doesn't do that as well. There's some faults in the way that's kind of applied or, or designed that make it look less believable. Um, but as far as imitating brick, I, I think it's less successful. It, it hasn't proven to be as successful, in my opinion. Nick? Um, you know, structurally, we're discussing that. It seems like our, our um, discussion is pretty clear on how we're moving towards that. And also because it is a historic district, I think we are more um, deliberate about how we make decisions, you know. Um, and if we have, we approve this for this particular new build, we'll have, there'll be someone else to come to say, well, I want to have to do this too. So then does it diminish the historical um, context of the uh, district? as well. I think that's my concern. And also that, that Commissioner Ann has said that, you know, would it would it diminish our historical designation, those kind of things, if we keep doing that, if we keep approving, approving, approving these certain things that are not original, then I, my concern is that as well. I, I appreciate the applicant and what they brought to this argument and the information. Certainly this technology's come along a long way uh, in the, the years since it started, and the, uh, certainly the problems with EFIS are a lot less than they were initially when a lot of times the application was not what it, it requir was required to, to make a watertight building. So I, I think that a lot of that's happened. Unfortunately, we're, we continue to be in a, an industry where most of the experts are salesmen. And you know, if there are independent testing, if there are other examples that have been out there for, you know, a number of years, then it makes it easier to make a decision on a newer technology. But, uh, but we don't have much of that, and I haven't seen much of that with respect to this. Um, I, I, I do think that this commission is in it for the long haul. You know, uh, Second Avenue and Lower Broad have been there for a long time, and it's our charge to make sure that it's as good 50 or 100 years from now than it is now. And so uh, my, my sense is that I don't have the confidence that the imitation brick would, would meet that standard. I do think that the uh, stucco has had a longer life record. We've had great experience with it at Vanderbilt and a number of other places. And so, uh, so I feel much more comfortable with that. Would you like to follow up with the motion? Sure, I'd be glad to. I, so can I yeah. make a motion and then I've got some dish. Okay. Well, so let's, let's do it just in case we don't yeah, want to do an amendment or anything. Uh, well, I, the applicant has come to us for something very specific, and, and I'm sure we'll respond in kind to that. Um, I would maybe like for us to touch on, in, in the interest of, of um, the applicants, perhaps not having to come back and wait 30 days if, the, if, that's, if they choose not to, is there some discussion about 
the building and its presence uh, and detailing that would, and this may be included in your motion, would be appropriate uh, if there were a change in, in material on the sides where they have the structural issues that they're trying to solve. Would we want to talk about that at all as perhaps um, an amendment to a motion or, or, or anything like that, or, or can we let them come back with that? And the staff may want to come comment on that as well. I, I think they've already made it a suggestion, so I, I, in the interest of time, I wonder if we might have a little discussion about that, and if, if legal thinks I'm getting out of bounds here, feel free to slap me on the hand. And, and I think um, that historic, it's, um, the um, staff had said that, that they would um, or uh, maybe that's still appropriate, but it said that they were okay with the EFIS just not mimicking brick. But um, is that so, so which would help the structural issue? Ben, did you have some specific comments about detailing color or that kind of thing that would be helpful to the staff as they review? I, I don't, but I think giving them some guidance if, if we. Um, if, if the brick is deemed not appropriate, um, given the applicant and or the staff some guidance that they might be able to figure this out uh, with the applicant um, and certainly with our bless it, blessing or, or agreement um, that, that that would be possible. I, I do think the other aspect of this is that there, there are a number of stucco finished sidewalls to buildings in this district. And so it seems to me that that, you know, even if there's a change in materials, that is not something that's unusual to be seen. The architects already addressed the, the wrap of the brick so that it's not just a thin edge at the front, but it, it wraps back. So um, I, I think if I could, with respect to 122nd Avenue South, I move uh, for, um, for approval of the smooth finish EFIS on the sixth floor uh, and on the sides of the building, subject to staff review of all detailing colors, uh, textures, finishes. Our motion, do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any more discussion? And that would yeah. not, by, by omission, that doesn't approve the imitation. Yeah, and, and the word stucco, stucco finish should be in there, not, not the brick. Okay. <laughs> And with that, the transition of the corners and into the new. Yeah, and, and that's already in the drawing. Right, so right. I just want to make sure that we have the transition. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. 2115 to 2117 White Avenue. Uh, to put, uh, before I start, um, I think the applicant passed, oh no, we'll do that. Um, I, when I put together the staff recommendation, I forgot to include the um, SP that was passed by the council for this, for this project. So just because it might be referenced, I wanted you to have a copy of the SP that was passed in 2013. So 2107, 2111, 2115 White Avenue um, are a collection of three houses that were constructed circa 1977. They do not contribute to the historic character of the Woodland and Waverly Historic Preservation Overlay, and staff is supportive of their demolition. Um, the the um, So it's three lots that are together, um, and in 2013, the council passed an SP zoning for the site, allowing for the construction of a cottage development with eight, uh, eight detached uh, single-family houses. The Metro Historic Zoning Commission at that time did not have the opportunity to formally review and vote on the SP prior to its enactment. Um, that's something that we do now. We have, uh, we usually look at uh, SP plans before they go to the council uh, for their final approval, but in 2013 that was not part of the process, so we didn't look at it. Um, the commission did not look at it prior to it going to, and being approved by the council. Um, the SP ordinance for the site stipulates that the architectural plans for the site must be approved by MHCC. So just for a recap, here is a um, 
timeline. So in 2013, uh, the SP was approved. In August of 2014, the project came to the commission and um, MHCC approved it with some conditions. In October of 2014, MHCC staff um, received revised drawings and um, felt that they reflected the conditions, um, the conditions of the MHCC's approval. So the preservation permit was issued. Um, preservation permits are only valid for one year, um, and no construction began between October 2014 and October 2015. So the permit expired um, formally in October 2015. Uh, now here we are in October 2017, and um, it, it is a new owner for the site, but there's a new application with the same drawings that were approved in 2014 um, for the project. So brief recap, we've approved the project in the past, but that preservation permit has expired. Um, it's the same drawings that are being put forward to you today. Um, so the eight single family houses uh, proposed for the three lots will be arranged so that the three houses, the f three houses will face White Avenue, so that's lots one, two, and three. Um, the submitted site plans do not show the front setbacks of the adjacent and nearby historic properties. Um, it seems like the 40 foot setback could be appropriate, but um, we're not able to assess that formally because there isn't, um, because information wasn't provided about the adjacent front setbacks. Um, in a project like this, where it is a cottage development and houses are, there's eight houses on these lots, um, moving a house forward or back um, to m make an appropriate setback could have a big effect on the overall project. Um, so staff, um, cannot recommend approval at this time for the front setback because we just don't have enough information. The site layout shows that units four, five, seven, and eight have widths that match one lots one, two, and three. So the kind of the rear lots have widths if you're looking at the width, even though they kind of face the interior courtyard, what we're considering the widths of the the facades that face White Avenue, um, they are all pretty much identical within six inches to the front units. The design guidelines state that, quote, interior dwellings for cottage developments should be subordinate to those on that front the street. Subordinate generally means that the width and height of the buildings are less than the primary buildings that face the street. The guidelines further state that, quote, interior dwellings for cottage developments should be tucked in behind the buildings facing the street. Because the rear units have widths that match the widths of the street facing houses, staff at this time finds that the site layout does not meet the design guidelines. Basically, the width um, is just not subordinate enough and it isn't tucked in as the design guideline states. Um, so I'm going to go through fairly quickly the front facades for each of the eight houses. So these are lots one, two, and three that face White Avenue. So these will be the prominent ones facing, um, facing the street, the most visible. And then here are the two lots in the middle, uh, lots four and eight. Um, in the interior, there's a courtyard there, so there's no house directly in the middle. And then here are the three lots, uh, five, six, and seven, that are at the rear of the property. Um, so here is a chart, it's kind of small up there, uh, but um, it's, it's detailing the heights and widths of each of the eight houses. I won't go through them all in detail, but in summary, the houses that are in the interior that are behind those three that face the front are on average about, um, let's see, I think it's one foot to, Sorry, um, I think they're, they're on average they're about like a foot or so shorter and, and about as wide and just only about a foot to not even two feet shorter than the houses that face the street. Um, so staff finds that the height, width, and scales of lots one, two, three, one, two, and three, which face White Avenue, do meet the historic context and do meet the design guidelines, but find but we find that the rear units, units four through eight, are not sufficiently subordinate in height, width, and overall scale to the White Avenue facing houses. Um, so for lots four, five, seven, and eight, the widths, uh, again, that's defined as those, the facades that are facing White Avenue, um, 
either mesh or just a few inches narrower than the front houses, and that the rear units are not tucked in as the design guidelines state they should be. Staff further finds that the rear units that are two stories in height and just an average of one foot shorter than the front houses are not subordinate. If constructed, there will not be a discernible difference between the height and scales of the front houses and those at the middle and the rear. Staff does not find it to be appropriate to enlarge the white avenue facing houses in order to make the you know, one solution that the applicant has offered is maybe making the houses facing the street larger in order to make the ones at the back more subordinate, but we found that that's not an adequate solution, that just the height, the overall scale and height of those middle and back houses need to be um, much smaller than they are. The commission and MHC staff did determine that these same drawings met the design guidelines three years ago. Um, however, at that time, the during the, you know, during the past three years, the commission has become more concerned and has learned more about the effect that larger developments, particularly these cottage developments, can have on historic neighborhoods and particularly sites like this, which are mid-block in the middle of um, what is otherwise a single family and, and two family, sometimes neighborhood. Staff now finds that the eight two-story homes do not meet the historic context and the design guidelines. Uh, just here are some quick photos of the uh, immediate context. These houses are all um, on the same side of the street of White Avenue. There are two um, fairly tall two-story structures on um, the same side of White Avenue as this house, or as this property. Um, and then these are sites, historic houses across the street. Uh, the house on the top left is a duplex that was I think approved maybe within the last year by the Historic Zoning Commission. Uh, it is two stories in height. Uh, so in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval, finding that the height and scale of the rear structures are not sufficiently subordinate to the three White Avenue facing houses. Staff finds that the project does not meet sections 3B2A, 3B2B, 3B2C, 3B2E, 3B2F, and 3B2J of the design guidelines. Um, the applicant is here. If you have any questions, I'm also happy to answer questions. Real, just real quick, can you go back to the history one more time? Sure, yeah, I'll go back to the timeline. <laughs> I apologize. That's, right it's confusing, there. which is why I added it in. Um, <clears throat> so the SP was approved in 2013. In August 2014, uh, the Historic Zoning Commission um, approved um, similar drawings um, with some conditions. Um, so the drawings were then revised between August of 2014 and October of 2014. When we received the drawings in October of 2014, staff um, looked at them and, and at that time found that they met the conditions of the um, commission's approval. Uh, and then um, our permits are only valid for a year. And uh, so no work took place, um, the, the houses are, the existing houses are still there on the site, so no work took place between 2014 and 2015, so the permit expired, um, and so now here we are in 2017. Were, the, were they bigger in the, were they the same scale in the rear as they are now? Yes, so what we, what's, what was approved in 2014 is it's identical what to what we have. Yeah, the drawings have not been changed since the 2014 permit that was issued. Okay. Any more questions for staff? Okay, thanks. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward and um, state your name and address? Jerry Andrade, 754 Benton Avenue, 37204. So I'm going to start with uh, thanking the commission and the staff for their attention to this particular project. Autumn and I will be speaking uh, regarding this project. We are huge proponents of historic renovation. Since 2011, we've done historic renovation in this particular neighborhood all the way to date. Each year, we've done at least one. All of those have been historic renovations. We have not done any teardowns or any builds from scratch in Woodland and Waverly. So we have a solid history of the standards for Woodland and Waverly. We understand uh, what historic reno renovation looks like, and we also have worked closely with Robin and, and staff on this uh, on these particular renovations. So so we've we've got a lot of experience here. Uh, on this particular project, obviously, we have a difference of opinion. Um, and I'd like to go through each of the uh, the guidelines that are stated and the ones that are, were proposed uh, we may be in violation of and talk through those. So with respect to 3B2A, and I, I think each of you should have received uh, a folder that has uh, a copy of the 2014 staff recommendation and the meeting notes. Um, and I'll be referring to those. The relevant sections have been highlighted. So with respect to 3B2A, which is height, that addresses the height, uh, the roof of the new building, I just want to state as 
as was already alluded to, these are the original plans. Nothing has changed. We've just resubmitted those. Uh, the, the, the guideline itself has not changed either. So from, from my opinion, we see it as the height of the buildings is still the same. It's still proposed same. Nothing surrounding has, has done anything in terms of height with the exception of the new building that's gone up on White Avenue, which shows a, a two-story structure of, of a higher height. So, so we would respectfully say that, that it does meet the height standards. Same when it comes to scale. Um, the scale has not changed. And again, the standard itself, 3B, 2B, has not changed as well. And uh, it, you can see the examples on page 12, 13, and 14 of the 2017 staff rec recommendation that show pictures that show structures of similar scale. When it comes to items C, E, F, and J, which relate to rhythm, roof shape, orientation, and uh, multi-unit detached developments in general, I think as was spoken to, the main, the main issues that are being discussed are number one, subordination. You heard that, that term. Uh, I'm gonna repeat the, the standard specifically for multi-unit developments. Interior dwellings should be subordinate to those that front the street. I'll repeat, should be subordinate to those that front the street. We'll see that in the recommendation, and I completely understand this, it says that the designs are not sufficiently subordinate, and that may be part of where this confusion arose as to why in, in this iteration in 2017 it's different, but the standard itself does not describe uh, sufficiently subordinate. It merely says subordinate, which is why we submit that even though it was one foot uh, on average, that it's still subordinate in terms of, of height and structure from a subordination perspective. Um, we feel that back in 2014 when these same designs were evaluated, that was the standard that was held, whether or not the subordination, whether it was subordinate or not, and sort of a black and white protocol as opposed to sufficiently subordinate. And uh, we, we have not seen any description of what entails in terms of sufficient subordination versus insufficient subordination. So that's what we submit there. The second point of contention that was described, which which I think is, is has some validity to it, is the definition of tuck in. So in 2014, as you look in the packet to the recommendation, uh, the standard of the, the buildings needing to be tucked in, the rear buildings, is described. It isn't, uh, it isn't referred to in the meeting notes or in the staff recommendation, but it simply says that uh, the building should be tucked in. When I looked in the standards document for the Woodland and Waverly Design Guidelines, there is nothing beyond just saying tucked in. So the actual definition of tucked in isn't exactly clear, so I have to be, uh, be somewhat impromptu in terms of how I describe that. I think of tuck in as just behind, right? Can you see it? Can you not? I tuck in my shirt. And that's, that's, what I, that's what I use as a definition. So when we look at these, we included a copy on page one in your manila folder that is the front-facing view of, of the uh, development as designed by the architect. This is the original architect who also submitted the 2014 plans. Um, that rendition was specifically created to show that you cannot see the, uh, the rear buildings head on. Now obviously if you're driving up the street in any rendition you would see some component of the rear buildings, but uh, the head on is the, is the definition that I'm looking at from a tuck in perspective. I also think that's, I can only surmise that's what the 2014 uh, commission looked at when they were evaluating tuck in as well. So that uh, those are the two points that I think are, are really important in terms of the challenges. When it comes to height, scale, orientation, uh, and roof line, that's what I would submit the discussion would be around. After the, uh, the 2014 staff recommendation, you'll also see a section for uh, meeting notes from that meeting as well. You'll see that there are several statements in support of the Germantown cottages being beneficial to that particular area. And multiple members also reference the designs falling in accordance with the height, scale, rhythm, and we've, we've highlighted those for your review as well. So I'm going to stop at this point and have Autumn come up and complete her description as well. Hi guys, my name is Autumn Andrade and I've lived in five homes in Woodland and Waverly. We've lived in four together in the last 10 years and currently my primary residence is 754 Benton Avenue. I love historic homes, I love the historic neighborhood, I love historic architecture. There's nothing um, 
just about nothing that I love more than, than the history of these homes. Um, I've renovated over 50 homes, more than 50 homes that are pre-1940s and actually won an award from preservation uh, of one of those homes recently. Um, we are also very active in the neighborhood. Some of the people that are going to get up here and, and oppose this are not just my neighbors, but they're my friends. And no offense, I don't always agree with my husband, so I don't expect to always agree with them either. But what I want to say is I don't just think this is good for us as a business. I think it's good for the neighborhood. There are currently only nine homes available under $500,000 on the market. And this gives us an opportunity, a cottage style structure like this gives us an opportunity to provide, I can't use affordable and I can't use working class because those basically no longer exist in Nashville. But we do have reasonable priced homes that young families, teachers, firefighters can come in and you know live in a walkable neighborhood where they can get to the bus stop, they can walk to some restaurants and they can get to work within two miles. So. I would like to ask that you guys um, accept our proposal to build these homes. I, uh, I think that we are the good guys. We're not trying to come in and just make a bunch of money and roll out in our, in our Mercedes. We, uh, we really care about the neighborhood. We really care about the people that live there. And we think they're a good project. And I hope that we get your support. Thank you. Thank you. Any um, questions at all to the applicant? Okay, thank you. Open public hearing. Would anyone um, like to speak regarding this project? Um, please come forward and um, state your name and address. My name is uh, Tommy Lerner. I live at 2215 Grantland Avenue. I've been in the neighborhood since about 1981, seen a lot of changes. Um, this, this project has caused a lot of uh, talk in the neighborhood. It, um, we didn't have any input to the SP, although we were opposed to it uh, for the most part. Uh, most of the neighborhood would, would accept six houses, eight we feel is too much. Um, number one, um, the orientation of the houses. Um, in some of the historic guidelines, the, the orientation of new buildings, front facade shall be visibly consistent with surrounding historic buildings. In other words, they should face the street. Uh, three of the houses face the street, the other uh, five do not. Um, that, that's one aspect of this. Uh, the permit has expired, so the question is, does this whole process start over again with uh, submittal of plans and specs? Uh, the setback, I guess, that needs to be measured. Um, we're kind of afraid that this might set a precedent. Uh, we, it's a, we live in a small neighborhood, and we, we found at our organization to preserve a look of a turn-of-the-century neighborhood, and this massing of buildings does not, not preserve uh, the feel for the neighborhood at all of an old neighborhood. Yeah, maybe in a new one, but, you know, our neighborhood started uh, really before, before 1900. So we've, we've tried to preserve, you know, something that lo looks nice. And this new um, construction right in the middle of it kind of defeats that purpose. I see my time is up. Uh, sure is. Thank you. I was looking at you and didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak regarding this project? My name is Elizabeth Horton. I live at 726 Benton Avenue, and our son and his family live next door. I, we did own the property across from the, the um, development, but we've sold it. Um, meanwhile, uh, cluster housing just doesn't, 
isn't historic. So back four years ago when this came up, the neighborhood was asked by the council person, what does the neighborhood think? If you get a petition, uh, I can better judge. So we did get a petition. We went up and down the street. We, we talked to 40 homeowners and nobody but one person was <clears throat> in favor of cluster housing. So, um, that, and that's understandable. There were three people who were undocumented who didn't want to write their names down, so that's understandable. Meanwhile, we did an online survey and 120 people wrote in some really great comments and they were not in favor of it. So it's really the cluster housing, not that we shouldn't have, not that they shouldn't tear it down. They probably should tear those houses down and build something else. But we said, well, why not just put two houses on each um, lot? That would be six. And you don't need a variance because that's the zoning. Well, that th th they went, uh, they didn't go ahead with the project. So we were pleased with that, but I'm a, basically I'm a historic preservationist, so I'm, I'm there to <coughs> guard. <coughs> My husband couldn't be here today, so I'm gonna read his letter, and um, that sort of sums up what we feel personally. We're not speaking for the neighborhood, but basically the neighborhood was not in favor uh, of it. I'm sorry, it's Tom. I was just about to say, I'm sorry, you just about to say, but I think we, think we understand it well enough. Um, do you, yeah? So, yeah, uh, thank you very and much. I did my two they minutes? They did get a copy of the letter. Oh, they did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, thank that, you very much. That's basically what it is. Okay. Um, did anyone else like to come forward? Okay. Thank you very much. Seeing none, um, you, I think you did have some time for a rebuttal if you guys wanted to. Yeah, just two items to address. Um, Number one, the setback, I forgot to mention this. Uh, there was a point about the staff not having a d enough information to analyze the setback. Uh, I'll refer back to the 2014 recommendation where the approval was made subject to conditions that the setback met another property on White Avenue. I don't remember the actual ad address, but that, that information is highlighted. 2105. Uh, so we ask that uh, approval could be subject to those same conditions that uh, that instead of pushing it back for analysis, um, that we just put the same conditions that were in place in 2014. And then any comments? Yeah, there was a final site plan that was complete back in 2014, and they have those setbacks at 40 feet, which is the same as, or roughly the same as the, the neighbor next door. So that's, those setbacks are as recommended by staff. And then, and then finally, I'd submit, I, I know there's been a, a lot of discussion over this in the past years. We, we honestly feel like this would be beneficial to the community, that those three duplexes that are there that have already been deemed non-contributing are, uh, are not representative of what the community is and should be. And so that's why we've submitted these plans that, that both work, in our opinion, from the historic context and from the development context that brings more of this reasonable housing as we've classified it to Nashville. And the argument today is not about whether or not to get an SP. The SP's already in place. The discussion is whether or not they fall within the guidelines, which I think you'll see in your, your packet that, you know, just three years ago they did. Um, I don't think the rules have changed as far as those guidelines go. Um, I think that's it. The commission has already made a couple points about exceptions to the standards. I think those have been well made. We, we would encourage you to, to withhold the standards at the same level as well. Once, once determinations have been made according to the standards, we think that our group should be upheld to the same standards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Wait, did you have a question? I have a question. Um, do you have a timeline on your SP? A timeline on the SP? Yeah, you have an expiration on that. Uh, I don't believe that there is an expiration is on the SP, is there? We called and confirmed that the, the SP was still, yeah, still in effect. Still, not the preservation permit, yeah. but yes, for SP. the SP is still in effect. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank. You. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was going to make that point. I think there's the number is already dictated in SP, so um, that part is already part of it. Just in case the commissioners didn't understand that, it's it's the points that the um, report brings up is that we're talking about today, not the SP. Discussion. 
close public hearing. Could you explain to me why it was approved in 2014 and, um, and why it's, they're disapproving it now? Well, um, <laughs> did, did I, miss, I miss something. Is that? I'll, no, no, no. I don't know. I, 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 I'm, 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 yeah, I'm highlighted in multiple spots. So yeah, you I, are. I'll go ahead and say. I, Staff, I don't, I'm not sure if they them. approved it then. I gave us. Well, I, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly no lawyer, and, and we do have legal representation that can clarify this. I, I think. It's a matter of record that the project was approved. Uh, well, there was an SP process. This this went through that process, which the commission, this members which have changed on this commission was not part of that, and the staff didn't review that in at the time of application. That process has changed, okay. but okay. a base zoning issue has been decided, and we don't have an influence on the base zoning issue of the number of units. Um, the expiration, comments notwithstanding, the expiration of, of a preservation permit is just that. It's the expiration of a preservation permit, so it's here before us today to reconsider it in the sense of its, of the application of, of the guidelines to this project specifically. And I'll leave it at that. I, I mean, I think the, mem the makeup of this commission is different now than it was then. Um, my, I, I don't disagree with my comments that have been highlighted or, or brought to attention here now. I think that they're still, my opinion is they're still applicable. Do, do you mind just um, keeping the dialogue, go conversation going, Ben, and just um, well, maybe? I, I, for one, am consistent on the commission, so actually I'd, I'd prefer not to do that because I think um, th 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 there's new faces up here, and, and this is a matter of interpretation. Um, for these folks here now, I don't think the the rules haven't changed, and 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 but but we're our, our charge is to apply the guidelines, so that's what we need to do. Best laid plans. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can give a little background too, just from staff's perspective. Um, first of all, the SP allows up to eight, so that's up to eight. It doesn't mean you definitely have to approve eight. It doesn't mean that those, if you want eight, that those eight units have to all be in eight different structures. There's the possibility of changing an SP. Um, it's just, it may go through planning, it may go through planning and council. Back then, as, as Commissioner Mosley noted, the process was very different and we were not involved and you were not involved as you are in SPs now. So at the time, I think there was a feeling that uh, you were sort of stuck with the SP that was approved by planning. Um, but the preservation permit has now expired. We have learned a great deal over the last few years. Although the guidelines may be the same, you of course interpret them differently now than you did years ago. And so we thought it would, since it was expired, it should come back to you for, for a fresh review. So um, you were saying we can um, change the SP because since it says up to we do have we have that latitude into it there's really two different pieces to the SP there's the the text that explains how it all works and how many units there can be and that says up to and then there's also the site plan okay. and any of that could change if it depending on what kind of change it is it may only have to be approved by planning if it's a, a much more major change it would have to go through council as well but and planning would make that decision as to. However, your recommendation doesn't change the number. It was the um, uh, height and scale of the rear structures that was subordinate. That was and our recommendations for disapproval because uh, we on those were things. just. And I agree. You know, it is tough because they've been a great company to work with, and they've done a lot of great work. And I'm sure it's frustrating seeing how this was approved a few years ago and now we're recommending disapproval. But again, we've learned a lot over the years and a cluster development that was done in Germantown, in my opinion, works really well 
But Germantown is a very different historic context. The buildings are much closer together. There's much more of a diversity there. Here you have less diversity, of diversity in the architecture itself, but in terms of setbacks, side setback, front setbacks, you know, front yards, side yards, you have much more of a rhythm. And we, staff is very concerned that this type of development, if all these buildings are essentially the same size, isn't meeting that requirement. Um, what you have in this neighborhood are principal buildings that face the street and are large or medium-sized homes, and then behind it you have subordinate outbuildings. And we just didn't find that this particular project met that requirement. Robin, how, um, if you were to recommend some guidance to these developers, how much more scale would be lessened in order to for you all to feel comfortable with? We it. talked about several different scenarios, and there's so many different ones. I wouldn't try to, if, if it were that easy, we would have just put that in as a recommendation for approval. Um, we talked about the possibility of the front three buildings being duplexes and then cottage units being behind that. I mean, there's lots of different possibilities, but we're not trying to offer that today. You want to say something, Ann? No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I did have one question for staff. Um, in the multiple pages of comments from the public that we have, I think only the, there was one letter that was dated February 4th to the councilwoman at that time, but of 2014. But what, what was the date? It appears that some of these go back to the time of the SP. And do we know when the comments were generated for these? I don't have exact dates, but yeah, all this information that was given to you, hard copy. There were some information, some public comments sent to you via email. This I received today, so it was given to you hard copy. That's all information from when they were working with the council member and trying to stop this particular SP back then. Okay. So that related more to the SP than to this particular hearing? Then. Well, they're, they're one and the same, really. Okay. I got this it probably doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on this one, but just out of curiosity within this district, how many non-conforming structures do we have that this would might implicate other cluster developments and how many in that neighborhood? Do you have any idea? I don't have a number for you, but there is one street that's close to the interstate that's almost all non-contributing. They're shorter lots, so I don't know that this would yeah, be possible. Yeah, I was about to say, this is a deep area right here. I'm not sure, I'm not, not, not sure if everywhere is this deep. I mean, I would be really concerned from the standpoint of the development of the neighborhood in the, the historic context, if in fact it was every other lot it would, was non-conforming, non-conforming, but you know, that's, we know that's not true because the percentages have to be such that um, there's so many contributing structures. But my, it's my concern that we set a precedent that, that, that encourages this. And and, well, then. and also, you, it, it went through a whole SP process. So even though we, could, we you know what I mean, um, it would have to go the before they could get this again, it have to go through that whole SP again. So it's not like a. Historic well, precedent, you know, we'd have we maybe I mean, SP precedent, but you know, I doubt it. We well, could, I, I think the process now has changed since yeah, that so we, we now review to, more of the SP we than we did then. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I mean, I understand that. Yeah, I, we I couldn't review it actually. But then. Well, it seems our purview also is because of how the contributing and how it, you know, the rhythm and spacing and massing compared to what it is. So. I'm, you know, that would be my consideration when in this context of the neighborhood. Saying yes or no, I'm just bringing it out. Okay. I'll, I'll ask the question maybe in, in, in a little bit different way. Um, some of the uh, 
um, neighborhood residents who've gotten up to speak in opposition and their points previously point towards six units maybe I don't know if desirable is probably not the word to use for community members. My experience is that generally more is just that. It's more, you know, three single family homes would be most desired here, perhaps by neighbors and um, folks living in the community. But is a house that presents the same front as that's what's printed here that's 64 feet deep times three on these lots, is that better, worse, different? Uh, I don't, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but another way to look at this, because th this is um, a zoning, a base zoning concept um, that I don't see, my, my personal opinion is I don't see it detrimental necessarily to neighborhoods, but this is approved as an SP and up to eight units are possible here. It does that fit the guidelines? That's, that's what the question is. And would three single family homes that were two story, that if you take out the spaces in between and were 64 feet deep and had the same frontage, are those appropriate? Are those more or less appropriate than eight units on the same lot? You know, you take a little bit out for the courtyard and that's the orientation here that, that I don't find problematic in a historic neighborhood. And because of just my background, I think offering smaller homes in, in a community that's an in-town neighborhood is not necessarily a bad thing, but I'm not sure that that's, that's just a zoning issue, not necessarily a historic guidelines issue. It does speak to the, the guidelines do speak to lot coverage and some of those other things. My comments previously, I, I, I feel like I feel the same way about this project that I don't see the very specifics of it as presented M my mind doesn't think differently now than it did then, and I've read through the comments um, that I made then. So that's what I'll say, and I, I guess that's my, that's what I'm bringing to the table is just a different way of looking at this, is, is three homes with that amount of coverage on here, less cars, le you know, less all, any of these things that, that, that we, we don't count cars when it comes to how we review projects. So that's, that's what I'll say about consideration of this as a, as an item, but it, it, it preservation permit expired, and what we said before is not. That's what we said before. What we're saying now is, is, is a different item. I didn't see my comments highlighted. Maybe I wasn't there that day, I don't, or maybe I didn't say anything. <laughs> but um, just lucky I yeah, Ben was always more eloquent anyway, so he's, he's much more highlightable. Um, but. Um, the, I, I, but I kind of, <laughs> but I do agree with him actually. For you know, I I really don't see a big. Uh, th th this project doesn't offend me much at all. Actually, I I think the, I mean that neighborhood is such a, you know, it's such a great neighborhood as far as the smaller scales and bigger scales. You know, they kind of have a a, a variety of of. Um, of inventory, um, you know. Now the up to maybe I would say, you know, maybe we don't have to have eight if we're going to get to that point. You know, uh, maybe it's it's seven if if that was the case. But even the subservient, the sub subordinate, yeah, mm -hmm. subordinate. I mean, um, the way they even even it's it's just a foot. I don't I don't feel that that's too. Um, I, I'm okay with that as well. Even especially the way it's done it. Um, so, and that's you know my opinion. If I had anything, I'd probably say just the maybe the house that's in the back, that's number six. Maybe if that were gone, but um, generally speaking, I don't have a problem with it. Sorry, a subordinate, be, you know, height and width. Um, so, <laughs> so that I, I think that's where I sort of struggle with that. You 
you know, in the planning commission, we call people out. So, uh, <laughs> whereas Cyril is trying to We've hide. We've already talked. Yeah, Cyril's trying to hide behind you. <laughs> Cyril, what is your feeling? You, you weren't here before, so this no. is all new. So. This is all new. And and in my time on the commission, there's been a lot of discussion that even goes back and digs up some of the old records about subordination of, of structures behind the primary street fronting structure. Uh, and so I think we've become much more aware of that condition uh, than others. You know, I, I personally find the development pretty pleasing. I, I, I applaud the uh, approach they've taken and uh, giving a reasonably priced home in these areas. Um, however, when I go back and look at the guidelines, that's where I struggle, and, and that's where I understand where where the neighbors are coming from, because w when you look at the guidelines, um, it, it says setback and rhythm of spacing. The setback from side and front yard property lines established by adjacent buildings should be maintained. Well, we're, it seems like it's doing that pretty well. Um, yeah, dominant rhythm along the street is maintained. Uh, so it, I, I see it complying with that. Uh, but but then when you get to orientation, the orientation of a new building's front facade shall be visually consistent with surrounding historic buildings. Well, that happens with three of these eight buildings, but not the other five. And so I think that, you know, this, this is a whole different concept than what was envisioned when this neighborhood was developed and what was envisioned when the guidelines were adopted. So I think, is this the concept? Can, can we get comfortable with this concept fitting within the guidelines and within this neighborhood seems to be the question that the neighbors and everybody that, and that we're struggling with at this point too. So I'm, I'm conflicted. I think it'd be a good place to live. And, and like Ben says, you know, I don't know whether the backs of three houses sitting, you know, you know, right there is better or worse than a 60 foot deep house that's towering over the adjacent property. So. Uh, so, so, so I'm conflicted on this. So. Kayla? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, I think S Cyril brought up a lot of good points. I mean, to me, the buildings that don't front White Avenue, just from the plan we're looking at on the screen now, don't read subordinate. I mean, yes, they are a foot smaller, but I think even in the staff report, you know, a foot shorter doesn't you're not going to be able to tell that from the street. I mean, granted, the streetscape, um, you know, does read predominantly the three houses. Um, but if we're going with the wording of, you know, it, the subordinate, you know, I don't think these read a subordinate. Um, do I love, you know, the idea of, you know, more house, more affordable housing? Do I love this idea of this development? Yes. So that's where I'm also kind of struggling. Um, but. I mean, they're not bigger, but I don't think, to me, they don't read subordinate. Um, so that's, I guess, my issue with it. Uh, you know, it just reads as eight of the same size house on, on these lots, um, which I think is what the neighbors probably don't want. But again, you know, we, didn't, we weren't involved in the SP process. I don't think, I mean, I know we like this development, how it's brought to us now, but I don't think we would have been hooraying this idea had it been brought to us at the beginning. Um, so that's my thoughts. Well, and I, I, I mean, I think, I mean, if we're going in a direction of giving the developers uh, some direction and, and maybe not approving this, we need to give them some guidance as what subordinate is. I mean, that, that uh, I think that guidelines needs to, I mean, we need to, we can't, we're, we're, we can't set it, but we need to at least to give them some idea what, what that term means. And I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> there is another clause within the guidelines, and although it's uh, italicized, it does address, it's section J, multi-unit detached development slash cottage developments. Multi-unit detached developments or cottage developments are only appropriate where the Planning Commission has agreed that the community plan allows for the density requested and the design guidelines for new construction can be met. Well, I think the SP exhibits that that, that, that has been met. 
The buildings facing the street must follow the design guidelines for new construction. The interior units need not meet the design guidelines for setbacks and rhythm of spacing on the street. Um, interior dwellings should be subordinate to those that front the street. Subordinate generally means the width and height of the buildings are less than the primary buildings that face the street. But uh, it doesn't say how much uh, less they are. Like no. Yeah, they get right, just less. And, um, and so I think that's... Tuck in your children at night. That's right. <laughs> that's a, so, so, so I think that's, you know, that, that's, that gives us something within the guidelines that helps us to, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. and, and it d deals with the orientation and, and, the, and it does address that. Okay. That's good. Sorry if I bring, oh, yeah, provide sure. a little more background. The idea of cottage, th that information was added to the guidelines after this SP. But anyway, um, the idea of cottage developments was that the rear units would be more like garage apartments. So when we were thinking of subordinate, we were thinking of garage size homes, not simply just a foot shorter and a foot narrower, but true cottages. Okay, so as a result of, of our conversations and especially uh, what you said, Cyril, I think that these um, structures, these one, two, three, four, five structures are subordinate. There are no guidelines that say how much they should be subordinate. And so I see that they are subordinate. And um, so therefore I would approve the project at, as it stands at this point. I mean, oh, just for guidance, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'm, however this is going to go, I mean, the, I don't think there's support. I just think it's eight of the same size houses on the, on these lots, and I just, I, don't, I can't get my head around that. Um, but if someone does make a motion to approve, to go against staff recommendation for disapproval and approve, um, how does one craft that, you know, because for the 2014, not that that has any, but we always have all the conditions and everything listed. So that's just something to think about. I'm not going to craft the motion because I, I don't think I'll vote for it, but. Um. Well, um, yeah, one thing I would just point out, I think that at least what Cyril did find, you know, the width and the height um, is good, clear, good, um, something that we can go back to, you know, that, that does show some, Coordinate, keep saying with subservient. So it gives some kind of more guidelines to that. If so, if we're going to make a motion, I think that at least gives some little bit more of a where we're where where would we be, be looking to be subordinate? I'm going back and looking at the conditions that were in the original approval back in '14, and. I think most of those have been met, um, or appear to have been met. Um, well, except for like shutters being operative and uh, uh, operable and things like that. Um, would would any of those need to be included in our motion today? If you wanted to approve, you could simply say that you recommend renewal of the permit from back in 2014. I see. Okay. Or if you wanted to disapprove, then you... Okay. Then that's okay. good. Are you about to make a point, Ben? Uh, Motion. Oh, I was just reading back through the record. Um, I, I think um, <clears throat> I'm going on not word for word here, but I, I, I'm not sure that in the final action of the commission in 2014 that all of the conditions were accepted. So I think a renewal, we need to be very specific about what we are and are not doing. I think wouldn't be unfair if the commission felt that they were moving this direction to um, put the conditions of the staff report on the previous approval or renew or disapprove. I, I just think it needs to be I would 
encourage us to be very specific about which, which directions or another direction that somebody might think or, or want to make a motion to, to, move, uh, to go in with regard to this project. Actually, the, the prior minutes that the applicant provided uh, have exactly what Commissioner Gee in his motion stated and included as far as conditions. And we, we've been told that the plans haven't changed since that time. And so the, the plans that you have before you are not what was submitted as part of the staff recommendation. They are the plans that were submitted as part of the permit. So, so some of those conditions were addressed in those drawings. So my recommendation is either you renew the permit or you or do you renew the permit with additional conditions if you wanted, but that the conditions of the staff report really aren't valid because what is before you is the permit that was issued back then. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you for clarifying. It does to me at least. Do, do you guys understand what she said? I could get you to say it one more time actually. The drawings before you are not the drawings that were submitted as part of the staff recommendation that those conditions were addressing. These are the, the drawings that were part of the permit. So some of those conditions were addressed in the drawings. Does that make sense? Yeah. I feel like I'm not saying it right. Do you? <laughs> they understand. I'm not sure I understand. The staff recommendation from 2014? Yeah. 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 The, the drawings you have are not from the staff recommendation. Of what year? Of this year? Of 2014. 2014. In 2014, there was a staff recommendation, and the conditions were made based on those drawings. Then the drawings were revised, and those were used to issue the permit. The drawings before you today were from the permit. Oh, okay. After the uh, right. 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 I got it. <laughs> All right. So let's 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 go ahead and get someone to craft a motion, even if we have to tweak it some. Okay. Well, maybe I would point to either Ben or Cyril if you guys would start it off. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that with respect to 2107 through 2115 White Avenue that the issue, that the permit that was issued in 2014 be reinstated or renewed, whichever is the correct legal term. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Do we have any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. Um, one opposition. Two. Two opposition. Okay. One, two, three, four. Okay. Motion carries. Fourteen oh eight Paris Avenue. All right. Um, the house located at 1408 Paris Avenue was built circa 1930 and contributes to the character of the Belmont Hills Borough neighborhood. Uh, this application is for alterations to the historic house um, that are considered partial demolition, uh, an addition, as well as an, a, a detached accessory dwelling unit um, that includes a setback determination. Um, so we'll, we'll start looking at the proposed alterations, which include altering the existing stoop covering, replacing brackets, um, demolishing the existing, um, uh, an existing enclosed rear porch, um, enclosing the existing side porch, altering windows and replacing existing siding. So the photos that, that you see here on the left is the earliest known photo of the house. Um, it was with the property assessor's file and dates back to circa 1968. Um, and the photo on the right is a, a more recent um, photo. So both photos show the existing covered stoop configuration and side porch. Um, there is no physical evidence of a larger stoop covering with a different pitch uh, than the existing covering, uh, which is what is proposed by the um, applicant. In addition, the stoop brackets appear to be the same as those in the 1968 photo. So, and then moving here, so this uh, shows the proposed alteration to the stoop covering. Um, as you can see, um, currently the, the the roof plane continues um, as part of the, the the stoop covering continues as part of the existing roof plane, and they're proposing to alter that pitch um, and extend it out to um, cover more of the the entrance. 
um, and also to repa replace the brackets with, um, with, with longer brackets. Um, so, the app so porches and primary entrances are typically considered character defining features which the Secretary of, Inter of Interior Standards requires to be preserved. Uh, so for this reason, alterations of the existing stoop overhang um, do not meet section 5.2 uh, for demolition, and staff would also recommend that the brackets be retained rather than, than replaced as, as proposed. Um, the applicant also proposes to demolish a, an existing enclosed rear porch. Uh, so the, the porch was originally um, an open covered porch as indicated by the 1957 Sanborn map which is shown um, on the right here. Uh, we also found that in the footprint in the, the 1968 property assessor um, file. So sometime after 19, 1968 this rear porch was enclosed. Um, so staff finds that the, uh, that the, the date of, of enclosure of the, the covered porch, the location at the rear of the house, roof form materials and design do not contribute to the character of, of the historic house or of the Belmont Hillsborough district and, and would recommend approval of uh, removal of, of this. Um, the plan also proposes to enclose the existing open porch on the left side facade with windows, um, which could be appropriate, appropriate as the floor to ceiling windows do um, continue to create that, that sense of openness um, that, that is characteristic of a side porch. Um, so staff would recommend approval of, of enclosing the existing side where porch as proposed. Uh, the plan also proposes to replace two sets of paired windows on the left side facade of the historic house with a large um, sliding glass door opening as shown here. Um, so staff finds that the proposed door opening is, is a type that you more often see on the rear of, of a home. Um, and, and is too large for the proposed location. Uh, so while windows are considered character defining features of historic homes, the commission has permitted alteration uh, of windows on the side facades of houses if they are uh, beyond the midpoint um, and do meet the historic proportion and opening of, of windows. Um, in this case, the proposed window, window alteration is not beyond the midpoint and given the, the location as well as the size of the opening, staff finds that the, the alteration is inappropriate and does not meet section 5.2 for demolition. Uh, the applicant also requests to replace the existing siding as well as uh, other windows on the historic house. Staff finds replacement of the, the siding with a fiber cement lap siding to be appropriate as the existing siding is a painted asbestos um, shingle siding that's not original to the house. Um, for the other windows to be replaced, the, um, they will retain their existing dimensions as well as grid patterns and staff would recommend uh, retaining those original window casings as well, um, but, but those alterations um, could be appropriate. Um, the plan proposes uh, a rear addition that's both um, taller and wider than the historic house, which is um, uh, outlined here what was supposed to be gold but kind of comes across as yellow, um, as well as uh, a single story side addition, um, um, which is outlined in purple. Uh, the footprint of the additions more than doubles the footprint of the historic house. Um, as far as setbacks, the addition would extend all the way back to the rear setback line um, and extend all the way to the right um, side setback line. Um, the lot at 130 feet deep is, is narrower than some lots that come before the commission, but looking at this block of Paris Avenue, that's um, typical for, for lots on, on that block of Paris Avenue, so staff um, would not consider that a, an unusual condition in this case. So the plan proposes a rear addition that incorporates a ridge raise and will be both taller and wider than the historic house. Uh, the ridge rays will be inset two feet from the side walls and will increase um, the roof by two feet vertically, um, which meets the design guidelines. Uh, the addition extends wider than the historic house on the right side by five feet, and that wider, that wider portion does incorporate that additional height that's created by the ridge rays. Um, an addition that's wider than the historic house could be appropriate in this case because the, the primary massing of the house is relatively narrow and is shifted um, to, to the right side of the lot. However, the design guidelines um, state that in these cases an addition may rise above or extend wider than the existing building. 
Um, however, generally the addition should not be higher and extend wider. Uh, staff finds that the portion of the addition that is five feet wider than the house and two feet taller uh, to be inappropriate. Also, uh, an addition that is both taller and wider doesn't meet the, the stated purpose of the ridge rays, um, which is, quote, to allow for conditioned space in the attic and to discourage large rear or side additions. Um, so in this case, we're, we're seeing um, a large rear addition in addition to that rich race. Um, the plan also proposes um, a single story addition to the right side. A side addition could be appropriate here um, as the lot is wider than 60 feet. Um, the proposed side addition is single story. It's located beyond the midpoint of the historic house, narrower than half of the historic building width, and has a side gabled roof form. Um, however, the, the roof um, of the side addition is attached to the portion of the rear addition that extends beyond the right side wall, um, creating um, what is a corner wrapped addition that, um, that the commission has found to be inappropriate um, uh, previously. So here we have the right side elevation, um, which includes um, that side addition that's proposed and the left side facade, um, and you can see the existing side porch that's to be enclosed with those um, floor to ceiling windows and the rear elevation. And staff finds that the scale of the addition, which is both taller and wider than the historic house, more than doubles the footprint and nearly doubles the depth, uh, does not meet the design guidelines which call for additions to be um, sensitive to the scale and proportion of, of the historic house. Uh, in addition to the addition, um, the, the plan proposes a detached accessory dwelling unit uh, that meets the design guidelines uh, for, for everything except for the left setback and the separation between the primary structure and the dadu. So here, got ahead of me. So here are the elevations that are proposed. It's uh, one and a half story, the height, uh, footprint, uh, dormers, they all meet the design guidelines. Um, here we see the site plan again. And you see the, um, the proposed left side um, setback. So the minimum left side setback required by zoning is five feet. The applicant has requested a setback determination to reduce that to three feet. Um, and then the minimum distance required between the primary structure and the dadu is 20 feet and the applicant has requested um, to reduce that to six feet. Staff finds that the proposed left side setback um, and the reduced distance between the DADU and the addition are inappropriate and are driven primarily by the scale of the proposed addition rather than site conditions. Um, as stated previously, the lot is somewhat shallow, um, um, but is not unusual for this block of Paris Avenue. Um, staff finds that a reduction in that separation between the house and the DADU could be appropriate and um, the commission has in the past required at least 10 feet uh, between the, 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 the DADU and, and the house and, and that could be appropriate in this case. Um, staff finds that the proposed three foot left side setback um, and the six foot distance between the house and daddy don't meet section 2B I2 of the design guidelines and 17.16.30.G.4 of the ordinance, but, but could meet the design guidelines and ordinance with a condition that the left side setback be increased to five feet and that the separation be increased to at least 10 feet. Um, so in conclusion, um, staff recommends disapproval of the addition, finding that the addition's height, scale, and rhythm and proportion of openings do not meet sections 2B1, A, B, E, and G, and sections 2B2, A, E, and F of the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. And furthermore, staff recommends disapproval of the proposed changes to the existing stoop covering and brackets, uh, as well as the side windows that are proposed to be converted to a sliding glass door opening um, on the historic <laughs> house, finding that the alterations do not meet section 5.1 for appropriate demolition and meet section 5.2 for inappropriate demolition. And finally, staff recommends approval of the, the DADU um, with the conditions that the left side setback be increased to five feet, the distance between the house and DADU be increased to 10 feet, and that the restrictive covenant for the DADU be submitted prior to issuance of the preservation permit. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Um, any questions for staff? I do. Melissa, I've got a, one question. Can you go back to maybe a front photo, the sure. ex exhibit photos of the... There we go. So one more thing to add. It appears in the documents that there is an additional change to the front of the house, which is a porch uh, base that's the a bricked porch base that's the full width of the front of the house and in large. Did you mention that earlier? No, I didn't mention that. So what's proposed there is um, they're proposing to extend that um, the essentially the uncovered portion of the concrete forward, which we, we wouldn't review. And so that's where you're seeing um, that extension. So essentially it would be like, a, um, oh, I'm losing words, um, like a patio, sure. kind of an extension. In an, uh, so as an enlarged front porch, if it didn't have vertical columns and the other parts of it would, wouldn't necessarily be um, inappropriate? Yes. Okay. Or not, yes. In this case, not reviewed since it wouldn't not be reviewed. covered. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? <coughs> Thanks, Melissa. Would the applicant like to come forward and please uh, state your name and address? Thank you. Okay, I'm Mary Margaret Turner. I am the homeowner, the homeowner of 1408 Paris Avenue. Um, I have my architect, uh, Alicia um, Surrey, with me here, just to clarify, because I might not get the terminology and everything um, exactly how you all require it. Uh, but I want to go back to the stoop coverage. Um, currently, the stoop is 18 inches long. So that will not be, um, that codes is going to require us to go out to six feet. Um, we were asking for the roof overhang to extend just pursuant to its original purpose to cover that front door as you walk in from rain or um, anything else, um, debris that's coming off the roof from, you know, hitting right on, you know, your front porch, your guests. Um, so that's the reason um, that we were asking for the extension just to simply meet um, you know, the codes, which is the six uh, foot porch extension. Um, the next point that I want to make is um, if we go to the taller and wider, um, you know, I understand historic's, you know, um, concerns. I love the historic neighborhood. You know, Melissa, we've spoken to her so many times, she's probably sick of seeing us. Um, the house is 29, 28, 28 and a half, 29 feet wide. So, and it's located more if you look at it on the right side of the property. The left side, there is an existing drive that we're trying to utilize for the DADU. Um, we only have five feet in width to go out. So what we are proposing is, it's, it's a little bit more of a hardship. So if you look at the guidelines, they say they generally do not allow you to go width and height. Um, I think that they wrote that, you know, with the knowledge that there is hardships pursuant to some of the original drawings, which is, um, I think, previously before the 1960s, closer to the 1920s, which this was built. So that allows a little bit of wiggle room for um, extreme circumstances, you know, such as, such as this hardship presents. Um, the, um, let's see. Um, in addition to the footprint argument being, you know, over the, well over the um, half of the original footprint, um, again, it's about a thousand, a little, a little bit over a thousand, and that's the outside perimeter that, that, that you are calculating. If you look at the home, there's no dormer. If you look at any other home on Paris Avenue and the majority in the neighborhood, there is a dormer. What the dormer allows you to do is access more front of that home. Um, in the in the upper level than you would if you were not to have the dormer. Um, so therefore, we're even we're losing even any more square footage um, than the typical people that you hear um, come in. You know, requesting um, you know the ability to have more square footage on the upstairs. Um, in addition to the the width hardship. Um, as far as the. The right side, if you look um, to Alicia's drawings, the right side addition that we are requesting, um, part of the reason why we are requesting that, it's, it's gonna be very you know, narrow. It's only a five 
foot, you know, width addition. Um, one of the reasons why we were requesting that is to apply with historic and try to hide where that width and extended um, upper level addition um, is that you can see. Right now from the road, the house sits on a hill. Um, if we were to put a roof line and have the side addition, which historic has approved, um, you know, we feel that, it, that, you know, we've done a good job at hiding um, any sort of evidence of the um, five-foot rear addition. Um, uh, I would like to discuss the DADU. I know I have short, short of time, so I might have to go, about and go back and reiterate. Um, if you look at the... If you look at the footprint of the home, um, we're just using, again, an existing drive. We're not going to the 14 feet of the width, which we would be approved through um, pursuant to historic guidelines. Again, we're just using the five foot in order to comply with the right side setback. Um, and if you look at the current drive, we're even stepping into feet. The DADU um, is in line with the two foot. That's simply... Um, the width of the DADU is simply to comply with the historic guideline. If you're going to have front facing in a drive, you have to have two, two garage doors. So in order to be compliant with that, we shifted it over three feet, which that just allowed us to just have that six foot. Um, if we were to have the 10 foot and the six foot setback, um, as requested by Historic, essentially what that would do is provide us with 14 feet width of, a, of an addition, um, of a rear addition. Um, so from a practical matter, laundry room, access to a back door, um, which we have a mud room, it's just access to the side of the house. Um, the back bedroom, that would, that would be, you know, that would be out of the question. Um, in order to fit, you know, our um, family lifestyle, um, we currently have two kids and are hoping to have more. Um, you know, we, we're just requesting enough to fulfill, um, you know, our requirements as a family, which are the general requirements of, you know, most modern families today. Um, as far as the footprint, the footprint is in line with the current square footage of the majority of renovations in, on Paris Avenue. If you look at the square footage of our request and the renovated requested, um, and the renovations that have been approved by the commission, they're, they're dead even. We don't want any more than, we're not asking any excessive square feet than we do not need for our family. Um, so we feel that the footprint argument um, it goes to our hardship. We have to go. We have to go deeper because we don't have much width. We're only going out five feet from a current 29 feet. Um, as far as the depth, we're still meeting the 20 feet setback. So, as they said, while there are some on Paris with a 130 foot depth lot, it's typical for a lot in the in this zoning and historic area to be 150 feet. Um, so. Again, you know, the, the rear setbacks, we've played with, you know, with this floor plan multiple ways. Um, any, you know, any other, it'd be, it'd be an extreme hardship to go all the way to the 10 foot and then five foot. Again, we have half of the distance. Um, and is there anything y'all want to clarify, Ryan? Right? Okay. <laughs> I got nominated. Can y'all tell? It was a it was a game of shortest straw. Um, um, as far as the wrapping is concerned, on that right side addition that we're requesting, we are not requesting for the um, front facade addition and then the rear addition. We're not requesting for those to meet or to be combined in any in any means. They are going to be separated and be pursuant to the guidelines. The two foot back set set in and the um, and the two foot rear. Um, I do want to address the height because they mentioned how the two foot ridge range, ridge range, whatever it is. Um, we were, whenever we were advised by Historic, we were of the understanding that as long as you had the two foot setback, the two foot set in from the existing structure, and then two foot rear before you went with the width, that you could have the two foot ridge raise. We were requesting the two foot ridge raise. Again, if we go back to the, to the dormer, we are losing so much space that the majority of the homes in that area are, are provided just by means of having a dormer. 
They have area and access to square footage in their upper level that we unfortunately do not have based on the current roof rage and structure of the home. We're not asking to offer to alter the roof rage roof ridge in any way, but only just to um, to increase the height by two feet, which is pursuant to the guidelines, as to allow us to make up some of that space um, so we can utilize more square footage um, in the upstairs area. Um, going back to the uh, footprint, um, because we do not have that, that square footage rid ray, rid, ridge raise um, and the dormer that um, without that, we would be significantly less in square footage than any home um, that's, that's renovated in the, in the neighborhood. They're around the 3,500, um, 4,000 4, square foot, um, which is exactly what we are requesting. Again, I feel that the length and the depth, and when you look at it on paper, but if you go and you look at the site, it's clear that location of the home, location of current drive that we're requesting to utilize, um, and, the, and, the, um, and the requirement that we're only allowed to go out to the setback of five feet in width um, has pretty much limited to us of what we can do um, with this home. So I appreciate y'all's time. I'm sorry yeah. if that was a little bit scatterbrained. No, it's okay. Um, do, it's good job. Um, do we have any, you have any questions for the applicant right now? Okay. Could I ask a question of the applicant? Is that ask, okay? Ask <laughs> if the garage door changed to one door, and this may be uh, for your architect, would that then en enable the garage to meet the five-foot side setback? I could reduce the width of the dado by two feet if it was a single 16-foot door. So that could take care of one of the three conditions. Okay. Thank you. Um, open up public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay. Seeing none, close public hearing. Discussion. Sort of carving these up individually, none of these uh, on the surface would seem egregious. Um, I don't know that it checks every box, but this project is, is checking up all the ones that I can think of in, in terms of um, up here and, and two car dadu there and, and all those things in combination. Um, admittedly, it's a smaller, less deep lot than, than others are, but I, I think with the siding of the drive, limiting an addition moving behind an existing porch sort of toward, towards the part where they have more, more you might be able to solve some of the conflicts that each of these things added all together, it, it seems like a whole lot. Um, and, and, and I think to suspend um, my feeling about the project as presented is to suspend one or maybe two of these things might, we've done before, but to suspend all of, uh, all of them in, their t in total, at least from, from what I've seen, and, and certainly understanding the applicant's desire to um, make a place for their family and their growing family, um, it just, it's a lot, uh, is, is my, my take on it, a whole lot. About the garage, if they, if they just created a, a one bay garage, and, and keeping in mind, you have two different components, but if you're just looking at the recommendation for the DADU, there's three conditions, and one of them is to meet the five-foot setback. So it sounds like if they change the two doors, which they did to meet the guidelines, but if you, you suspended that guideline and allowed for one door, the garage could then meet the five-foot setback. The other two, uh, th then the restrictive covenant, I'm sure they uh, have agreed to. So that would just leave one condition for the DADU. But then there's the other half of the project as well. You know, I think uh, I agree with Ben that, that you know, I, I counted, I guess, over half a dozen areas where this deviates from the guidelines. And uh, I, I can really appreciate and understand the limitation to the site and the difficulty in trying to do this kind of addition. But, uh, you know, I, I have to really uh, go along with the staff recommendations uh, and feel like they uh, pretty well identified that that would then give a basis for redesign of the, of the addition. 
granted it wouldn't be as grand and opulent, but uh, but I think you know it, it still allows for an addition, but not one that that uh, violates the guidelines in so many different ways. Um, I, based on that, I'd like to just throw a motion out that with respect to 1408 Paris Avenue, that we um, that we approve that based on the staff recommendations with the stipulation that um, that a single garage, single double width garage door could be used um, if that brought them into compliance with the staff recommendation regarding setback. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. Okay, any more discussion? Does that, does the motion mean we're just going with staff recommendation of disapproval of the project? Uh, disapproval of the project, but approval of the of the data with the conditions, but, but also with the caveat that they can deviate from what's normally expected, which is two, two single car, garage okay. doors and putting in a wider garage door. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. 202 Mockingbird Road. Okay, 202 Mockingbird Road. Uh, we have an application to alter the front facade of a contributing building uh, by altering two existing dormers on the roof and by altering a uh, the front entryway. Um, guideline, I will cite the guideline, two, um, 2B2A uh, says removal or alteration of historic features is generally not appropriate. However, inside, no, <laughs> that's not what the guideline says. Uh, generally, an addition, an addition should be situated at the rear of the building in a way that will not disturb either front or side facades. So uh, that's a guideline. Um, removing an alteration, this is um, me speaking now, not the guideline. Uh, is generally not appropriate. However, inside the attic, uh, there is evidence that these dormers are not original, uh, or at the very least, they've been altered, um, because as you can see in these photos here, the rafter lumber is much newer than the majority of the framing in the attic. Uh, and because the dormer roofs, roof forms, are not original, uh, an alteration uh, of a non-historic feature, essentially, would be appropriate. Um, and what's shown, what exists now are shed roof dormers. The proposal is to convert those to gabled roof dormers. Uh, otherwise, the dormer size and location uh, would, would be unchanged. Uh, gabled dormers are appropriate for this style of house. So staff finds that change to, a, uh, a f to the front facade to be appropriate. The proposal also includes the addition of a classical front portico uh, at the, uh, the entryway on the, the right bay of the front facade. Uh, although this type of portico uh, is not uncommon for the style of house, the colonial revival style or a federal style, uh, there is a substantial difference in this part of the application from the part about the dormers that we just discussed. Uh, and that would be that um, there is no indication that, the, that this entryway is not original or that it had ever been altered. Um, so while the proposal is something not uncommon to the style of house, uh, the addition does not meet the design guidelines or the Secretary of Interior standards, which say that conjecture, conjectural features should not be added. Or, or, or that a historic feature could should be uh, essentially it should not be altered. Um, this here, as I said, is the the existing front um, arched pediment uh, with side lights. It's it's um, also very typical of of this style of house. So there's no reason to assume, based on the evidence we have now, that it's not historic. 
Uh, and that's just a, another look at the elevations again. Staff recommends approval of the application to alter the roofs of the two existing dormers, finding that proposal meets the design guidelines. Staff recommends disapproval of the front portico addition and alteration of the front door, uh, finding that that's part of the application does not meet the design guidelines for the Cherokee Park Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay, thank you, Sean. Any questions for Sean? All right, thank you, sir. Um, would the applicant like to come forward and um, state your case and your name and address? Oh, I gotta hit that. Good afternoon, my name's Scott Denbo. I live at 202 Mockingbird Road. Um, we moved in the neighborhood because we love the architectural details of the, of the house of the house we moved into as well as the neighborhood and it's been a you know, great place to raise kids. Um, we've been there four years and are in the midst of uh, starting a full house renovation and um, appreciate Sean's comments um, you know, as regards to the dormers. Um, the, the main reason we're wanting to add a portico at this time is weather is a huge issue. This house is west facing and uh, we we'll certainly invite you guys to have a site visit if you have additional questions to see to see the way the weather comes and hits the house. Um, my wife's going to pass out photos uh, to you guys that I don't think we could be included in the um, presentation due to I think the picture quality that we had had, had sent in. Um, but the house is west facing. Um, when we moved in, there were actually two huge oak trees in the front yard. Both have since um, blown over as a result of bad weather. Um, and pretty much any storm that comes through, you know, storm, storms move east to west in, in the Nashville area, and pretty much any storm that comes through, weather pounds the front of the house. The overhang of the, uh, the gutters and the roof structure is actually fairly insignificant, and any water that, that hits the front of the house uh, hits the front doors significantly. Um, when we moved into the house back in 2013, we were forced to replace the sill around the, uh, the foundation where the, the actual house meets the stone foundation. It had been rotted out due to water damage um, from this constant battering. We have, in 2000, August of 2013, we had a contractor come in, yank out the, the rotted sill, the cracked concrete, and replace the whole front door unit, not the side lights but the front door unit um, due to the, the weather damage. Um, we spent, I don't know, about $5,000 in total doing those repairs, if not a bit more. And um, due to weather, the front door has still had significant damage. The damage, um, when we moved in 2013, had intruded upon the hardwood floors of the interior, the shoe molding, the, um, there's an HVAC duct, uh, or cold air return right next to the front door. Um, the ductwork had been damaged as well as uh, part of the foundation um, just getting wet from water over years. Um, we have, have re since replaced the front door. The front door we repaint on an annual basis with marine quality paint and again the weather just continues to damage it. As part of our Renovation, we, we would like to put the portico on, which we believe goes with the style of the house and the neighborhood. Um, we also believe that the, f that the front door and the side lights that are currently there are not the original front door. If you look at the picture that I think is included of the side lights, um, they're actually double pane glass that would not be original, original of the house as well as frosted and yet yeah, fake leaded glass. Um, but again, we continue to get weather damage over and over again um, that we really can't. Yeah, the, the, and you'll note those are those are actually double double pane glass, um, and there's really no no way to protect it. The other thing that that is not historical to the house is obviously the front stoop. Aggregate aggregate stoops were not um, typical in 1930s when the house was built, um, so we don't believe that 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 is. Uh, part of the original house, nor were the lights, which were installed sometime in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and we, we actually think the scallop part that goes over the door may not be original either. It's, it seems to be yet yeah, a fairly flimsy woodwork. Um, so 
we would like the opportunity to put this portico over the house to coincide with the renovation. We believe it is architecturally appropriate and it will do a significant job of protecting our front door. Um, the th one of the things that we have found out in going through the rebuilding process is that wood door manufacturers will not warrant front doors um, if they don't have some sort of overhang over them. And um, without that, we're not gonna spend the money on a front door or we're gonna put in you know, some cheap fiberglass door that would not be um, architecturally appropriate just because I'm not gonna spend $5,000 on a door and have it get, get weather beaten every year. So, um, yeah, yeah, and this is my, I'll let my wife jump in as well. Hi, I'm Erin Denbo, and I live at 202 Mockingbird Road. Um, I'll just kind of go through the pictures real quick and um, add anything that Scott left out. So everybody wake up and take a deep breath. I know we're ready to get out of here. I am too. So um, the first picture you have is the one with a sold, ha sold sign on it. This is when we moved in. They had removed the gutters. They, it has no shutters. They're not the original front lights, not the original roof structure of the dormers, not the original windows, not the original side lights. Um, n Scott said the aggregate. N the half round of the door, uh, the half round over the front door appears to be manufactured and maybe possibly not original. With all these changes made to the house, how can we per be for certain that there was not a front porch on the house at one time? So, next picture, this was the door when we moved in. It's, you can see the water all the way through it. This picture of the cold air return, that's base. it was wood underneath there. It's basically dirt now, or it was dirt before we, you could just shovel it out with a shovel. So much water came in. Um, um, this is the picture bef before picture of the basement. And you can see the, the wetness of and moisture on the front part of the house that is facing west compared to the south facing side of the house, which um, does, does not get the, the water damage or the water coming through. Um, so let's see. If you go back, let's see if I can go all the way. Are these all the pictures we have? We don't have the original. Um, like these, all these the pictures that 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 were in the packet of. Oh, they're in the. Oh, you the, do. Okay. The, for now. So you yeah. see that in the um, when we bought the house, there were two ginormous trees in the front yard. And that's a technical word. Um, and we took the one down because it was losing branches. And that is this picture you see we had it taken down. Um, the picture that has the door out of it, that's just showing that we um, refurbished the front door. Um, and then you can see the pictures where we put in the new wood to um, support the floor structure and um, on top of the foundation of the house. And then you did notice the, the huge tree, the second tree that fell. So now our house is completely bare with a huge blue tarp on top of it. Um, and we, we, we are, we're in a position that um, we still are getting a lot of damage to our house because of the weather and it gets hammered. And um, we invite you to come out and take a site visit, give us suggestions. We have a contractor, we have a builder, we have our wonderful Betsy Bergen who drew up the beautiful portico. Um, and we think it'd be a lovely addition to the house and it would really um, provide us with um, protection. So appreciate your time okay. and consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Any, any um, questions or comments to the applicant? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 
Open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay. Seeing none, close public hearing. Uh, discussion. Um, could I see the picture of the front door again? That is that a door, like a storm door, in front of the main door, right there, and so that storm door doesn't doesn't um, do what it's supposed to be doing. Evidently, maybe I do have a question to the applicant. So I would I would I thought that a storm door, the purpose of that is to um, buffer the front door from the weather. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, that is a screen door with water shedding screen. It, it doesn't work. Um, but that leads me to, if you look at the picture, you can see that water is coming in even below the side lights in the wood. And it's all been epoxied. And the front door was epoxied when it was re re repaired. And all the front was epoxied. And it just, with the sun hitting it. Um, yeah. Would a different storm door uh, help matters? Or is it still the epoxy no, on the side? That's it's, 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 a, it's a side it's, light. It's the whole structure, yeah. Okay, okay. thanks. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you. That's okay, thank you. Well, it, it's evident and evidenced by the photographs and by the applicants, um, you know, presentation here before us that this, <laughs> this is a problem and with the absence of the trees you know it's it's, it's worse I think we're hamstrung pretty significantly and not significantly but pretty um, it's it's specifically stated that conjecture for us to be the judge of what's what should be added or what shouldn't be added sh short of some other evidence I, I think they've presented convincing evidence that this all of these elements together are not original to the house, but to then go place something on the house that we have no evidence that that is appropriate either. Perhaps some more research might open the door to other options for the applicant, um, but I, don't, I personally don't feel comfortable saying, yeah, this is the one, this, this, this is right, this is um, the right thing to do. I, I don't discount that there's a problem and the homeowner wants to fix it. Um, I think the means that we have at our disposal to help them are, it says don't add <laughs> items, and I'm having trouble getting over that one myself. I, uh, others may see it that way, may see it differently. Yeah, I agree. I, I was, but I, did, Sean, did you have any, um, do we look, see any other um, examples, you know, or I any other, his, kind of just following along with Ben's point, we, we recognize that it is an issue. Any, any history or any um, suggestions that were made maybe at all about what? Not at this house. Would have been no. appropriate? Uh, no, I mean, only what's there is, is, you know, what we know to be there quite, you know, it's a tautology, but that's, that, that's, it is what it is. It's another tautology. Um, no other, no, no, no indication that anything other than the the segmental arch over the door that is there now. No indication that any anything else had ever been there. What's the age of the house again? Uh, Colonial Revival, typically. Uh, I probably have it in here. Um, nineteen thirty. Oh, yeah. okay, nineteen thirty. Thank you. So, so I think that, I mean, I, I talked about a site visit. I, I walk past this house on a regular basis going over to Starbagel from my house. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful house. I'm so glad that these owners are there and going to really love it the way it wants to be loved. Um, you know, you know un, unfortunately, and, and I'm, I'm glad to see the dormers changed because they never looked like right. they were uh, quite up to the stature of the front elevation of that house. And shutters and those things that they're proposing uh, you know, bring that house really to a great state. And, you know, unfortunately, the guidelines of the Department of the Interior are our Bible and Ten Commandments that we go by, and they don't allow us to change the front of the house in a situation like this. I mean, the one thing that I can offer up is that they don't prohibit you from changing materials. And fortunately, from the time that the probably poplar was used to build the surround on this and 
and all that, uh, you know, that entrance could be redone based on modern materials that would be much more durable. Flashing could be improved. Uh, so I think it would take a contractor that was really diligent and worked hard, but, uh, but you are able to weatherproof some of these. You know, uh, trying to do a natural wood door on a west face is, you know, it's tough unless you're willing to get out there every six months and, and do the refinishing and all. So, I mean, it's, it's things that are, that are difficult to deal with but not unique to this house and, and that don't make it different than a lot of other houses. So, um, as much as I would like to say, yes, let's do that other portico, I don't think the Department of the Interior, it's, not our, it's our charge not to make those changes. And so. You want to go ahead and make the... Motion. I, I, I guess I'll add, saving that there's some additional evidence that the that the applicant yeah. may want to research, find, uh, try. It, it may not be easy to find. It may not be there. But I, I, I short of that, it, it I, it's yeah. against the yeah. uh, against our our charge, as you've stated, to add things to where they where they maybe not have been. May I ask a question? Evidence um, of what? Well, we'll keep going, but uh, we, we were just saying if you if there is later some evidence of there may have been something else different there, we would um, we, you could bring that back to staff. But uh, let's just go ahead and make the motion and. And, and and so like Ben said, if there was an older photograph that was found, if there was other structural things, you know, embeds into the brick or something that showed that there was something else there. But so, something that we can lean on other than yes. just say, no, nah, this is right for this house right. uh, as, as a conjectural element that. Right. Sure. Uh, so with respect to 202 Mockingbird Road, uh, I move uh, for uh, agreement with staff recommendations. Second. Uh, on favor? Okay, uh, 215, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayfair Road is a 1932 Tudor Revival stone house that contributes to the architectural character of the Cherokee Park Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The application before you today is to construct a rear addition and an outbuilding. Uh, the project does involve some alterations to the window openings on the side facades. Um, this is the right side facade and the two window openings that are um, boxed with the, the red box um, in the photo are going to be, the one on the left is going to be removed entirely and then the one on the right will be enlarged um, from its current state. And then on the opposite elevation, um, the existing window openings are to remain, but the applicant is proposing two additional window openings um, kind of inserted in between the existing window openings. So staff is not supportive of altering the window openings on the side facades as they are character defining features of the building. Cutting the existing stone for new openings and patching the stone to remove the existing openings will have a detrimental effect on the historic character of the house. It is difficult to cut stone without creating a scar and it's also hard to find appropriate stone to fill in for those areas where the windows are going to be removed. Although the windows are not highly visible from the street, the fact that the house is stone ensures that the alteration of the window openings will negatively affect the house's historic character. Staff finds that the alteration of the window openings does not meet section 2B2 for appropriate demolition. Um, again, removal and alteration of window openings is considered partial demolition. Um, so staff is therefore recommends that the window openings on the side facades remain as they are and not to be altered. <clears throat> Here is a site plan for the project uh, showing the addition and the outbuilding. The back of the addition and the outbuilding will be connected with a covered walkway that is open on both sides. Um, the commission has approved uh, such walkways in the past. So we find that to be appropriate. Uh, and the addition and the outbuilding all meet the appropriate setbacks. Here is the floor plan. Um, just to make it a little bit more obvious, the pink area there is the addition and the area that's not shaded in pink is the existing house. 
Um, the addition is inset six inches from the two back corners of the house. Typically, MHCC requires that a one-story addition be inset one foot from the back corner of the house. In some cases, MHCC has, has permitted one-story additions to be inset just six inches. Um, that's typically when there's a change in material and when the addition is relatively sh shallow and not um, overly deep and also fairly minor in size. Um, in this case, there is a change in materials, which I'll show here in a minute. Um, it goes from stone to um, board and batten, stucco board and batten. However, the addition's depth is, is fairly large. Um, on the right side, the, uh, the total depth is nearly 50 feet, and that's deeper than a historic house. On the left side, its depth is over 33 feet. Um, because of the size of the addition's footprint, staff is recommending that the addition be inset the full two, uh, the full 12 inches or one, or one foot um, from both the back corners. And here are images of the side facade. I've outlined um, the addition just to make it clear. Um, it'll be one story in height and significantly shorter than the historic house, which staff finds to be, uh, finds to be appropriate. Um, the eave height will match that of the historic house, and the ridge height will be 20 feet, which is about 10 feet shorter than that of the house. Here is the rear facade. Uh, and here are the images of the proposed outbuilding. The outbuilding will not be used as a detached accessory dwelling unit. This neighborhood is zoned single family, so it cannot be used as a, as a dwelling unit. So, in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with the following conditions. The window openings on the historic stone house remain unaltered. The addition be inset one foot from each of the back corners of the house. Staff approve a stone sample. Staff approve the windows and doors, the roof color, uh, the material of the side entry stair, uh, the material of the floor and stair material of the rear porch. We approve the driveway material and that the HVAC be located behind the midpoint of the house or on the rear facade. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. The applicant is here um, to make his case. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Would the applicant like to come forward and um, state your name and state the case and name and address? Thank you. I'm Michael Marchetti, the architect and uh, builder. Um, so anyway, in regards to the windows, and thank you, Melissa, and she was very helpful through this whole process. Um, if you'll look on the um, rear elevation, if you can do that, that shows actually the section. It'd be the front uh, at very first. Excuse me? I think there was a drawing that had a section, but I didn't. <laughs> no, it's all right. Y'all can look at that. And let me give these uh, two, if you can, uh, and a couple of these pictures. And uh, hopefully I'm a better architect than a photographer. But the rear, uh, where we're tying on to, and in your package, if you look at that section that shows through the courtyard and looking at where those doors are in the center portion underneath that rear dormer, <clears throat> you'll notice, um, and that's what one of those pictures are there, it's the triple windows. And that's what we're proposing, the existing old windows on the back of the house, to take them and reuse them here in the dining room on the uh, right side elevation, if you can. There it is. So those are the existing windows that were on the back, and rather than taking those out and destroying them, we love them and got the old wavy glass. We also have the stonework from there, and she commented, uh, Melissa commented on the um, stonework. I have a great stonemason that is, that is old and been doing it a long time, and he can take that, I promise you, and we've done it numerous times, and you will not be able to tell the difference. It's also on the back portion of the house, as was stated earlier in a, a previous case. Um, and also, some of those pictures will show you taken from the street, which I know is a consideration, that the porch, the right side porch hides it. And if you look on the left side, I mean, there's heavy uh, mature landscaping and all that would hide it is there as well. Uh, again, both elevations occur on the back half of the um, side of the elevation, as was pointed out earlier, as a consideration for them. So these are two little small windows. Again, we can cut those in. We'll use the same jack arch, the same stone, and we're getting this stone from the rear elevation. So we'll take that and reincorporate it, the jack arch, 
uh, above the windows and such, and the limestone sills, we'll use those on the right side elevation. Uh, <clears throat> I know in the, the whole purpose of this is to uh, keep within the character and not tear off significant elements and so forth. Granted, I mean, windows obviously lead to it, but again, reincorporating these same triple windows, which are in Tudor Revival is used very often, and I want to use them here. Not only uh, they'll match the two that are on the front elevation, we've taken ones that are existing on the house and reusing those rather than getting new windows. In regard to the setbacks, if you'll go to the uh, rear elevation, and the side elevation. Also, I'll go back to the floor plan one minute if you don't mind. What I want to point out too is that um, in those, it is showing six inches, but, uh, and we'll go to the elevations in a minute, but the actual wall surface, these walls are like eight inches thick stone and then there is a, um, the wall themselves, the entire construction of the wall from the plaster on the inside to the stone wall on the outside is about 14 inches. So what I am proposing to do that we set this new addition in one foot from that stone surface and then on the bottom portion, now if you'll go to the side elevation, be great. I guess I can do this, can I? I'm not real uh, high tech. Uh, if you'll notice, I just want to bring up that stone foundation to our stone water table. Uh, purely on that lower portion. So the upper portion and the roof structure, uh, if you'll look at the rear elevation again, all sit in at least at one foot. And I'd also like to contend that if you can see the scale of the house, and I'm very adamant about this, um, and I have people go, oh, I want stuff bigger and all these kind of things, and I'm going, no, let's have a sense of hierarchy here where the main building is, it's, it's what's, it's the uh, main structure is, uh, has the proper scale to it, it's large and stuff, and then the smaller addition come off to it. And even though the footprint does extend out a little bit, um, and that's kind of getting back to the point about the windows as well, that is becoming a dining room. And in some of these old houses, they were cut up so much on the inside, you have these little bitty tiny rooms. So I'm taking what used to be their 1960s kitchen, and a little um, breakfast area and making that in the dining room. So I'm not destroying any of those walls, but in doing so, I'm having to remove this little tiny window that they had in the kitchen and then this tall six foot two window, I believe it is, that was in that breakfast area. And then I'm combining again, bringing those three windows around the old ones to the front. Um, so anyway, the proportions and all and how that and coming from the street I mean you, you can see from the side elevation you really can't even see that rear addition on any side because of the porch and then the gable that comes out on the uh, far left side of the building right side on this drawing here so I would contend that we certainly meet the intent of the ordinance uh, both in the window placement and in the uh, one foot setback um, and I purposely did that to meet the ordinance, but I just like the idea of the stone. And if one last thing, if you'll go back to the side elevation, I also like, and I think it reads that way in this, that you know you have this a solid stone house, and then we change this material and pick up, but we're transitioning from the stone to the stucco and the stone foundation, and then going all to stucco, that each little section gets lighter and lighter, and then to the open uh, connector breezeway. So. Anyway, that's all I got to say about that is, uh, he was said, I believe Dave Getz, who lived in this house, I think since the 20s, uh, would like to speak now. Well, I'm not that old. Um, again, my name is Dave Getz, and I live at 901 Clearview Drive, but I co-own this house with my sister. My grandparents, our grandparents bought this house in 1942. Uh, they lived in it until they died right before I was born in 1952, and parents, or the family moved in, and then I was born. It's the only house I ever knew uh, growing up. So I love the house, and I love what Mike has, Michael has drawn. Uh, it uh, really is going to be a wonderful place to kind of move, age in place, as they say, uh, going forward. Um, you know, we, I, I truly do believe that by reusing the, uh, the materials from the back of the house, it will not look like, um, you know, the same way as it would 
otherwise. And if he doesn't do it right, I'll make him do it again because um, I will be watching. Um, so I hope you will um, uh, understand why we uh, would oppose the first two recommendations from the staff and would ask you to um, approve the plans as, uh, as we have done and we'll meet all the other conditions. We're happy to do that um, uh, going forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you, Thank sir. Um, seeing no one in the audience, I'll open and close public hearing. So, discussion. I would just like to, um, up, I don't know, applaud the applicant and the architect for, again, as the architect said at the end of his proposal or presentation, you know, making it. Um, clearly subordinate and smaller than the structure. I mean, we see so many additions come through here that are ridge rays and make it two stories in the back, but make it waver, you know, it's just everybody wants more, more, more. And I just, I think this is a really nice um, uh, addition in the way you've done it. Um, so that's just my first comment. <laughs> to ask you a question about the, um, the uh, not Sean, Melissa, <laughs> he, he was looking at me, he was paying attention to me, um, about the inset, about the thickness of the walls, does that, I mean, did, did that, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Um, I mean, typically we have kind of allowed for something like that when the addition isn't quite as long as this, you know, we because they're, when you're going from a stone to a, um, like if you're, if you're having like a brick house and you're going to like a siding, you know, there's often... Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I don't want us to make it, I mean, I'm not asking the exception, I'm, right. I'm saying oh. the explanation, did it make sense that it really would meet that one foot with the thickness of well, the wall? The wall, yeah, the stucco part of the wall in the roof form would meet it, but the foundation part would not meet the one foot okay. inside. So that did make sense to us. I think that's up to you if you oh, find okay. that that is sufficient. Okay. So. Well, I just want to say, if Mr. Marchetti was my architect, I'd have 100% confidence in him as far as um, his stonework and his experience, um, plus taking the stone from the back of the house and, and filling it in. I, I, and I can tell with Mr. Getz, this is a well-loved home. It's a beautiful home. And, um, and I can tell that you, you would do nothing but um, honor the, the design of where you grew up, and I, I just want to say I appreciate your presentation. It's very nice. As um, kind of draw box around the argument of the one foot inset, I, I'll I'll say the in, see, the intent of that is, you know, if, if you have the thing and then you put a thing on it, it's pretty evident that you could take this off where there's a clear clear transition there, and, and I think that um, the architect through both roof line and that there is an inset, that's apparent. It, it might not be as obvious as brick versus the siding all the way down, but I think in considering the sensitivity of the materials of this house, um, the design details, I, I don't necessarily, <laughs> I don't want to want to punish this abs applicant with, um, and punish probably not the right word, w with, with something, and I, I feel like the intent of that being different is met uh, in, in the fact that there is a 12-foot inset from the stone that goes all the way up the first floor. It, it's using like materials, but it, it, it's apparent in the drawings to me that I, th I think those things would be distinguishable from each other. The house resolves itself really fairly cleanly where it started it, it started and stopped here and, and at the, this piece is, yeah. is I, new. we, we just need seamless. to make sure that, that in our motion i mean that we we are not making exceptions we it does sort of meet the intent of that uh the guideline um you want to talk about the windows yes what about the windows um it seems that's one thing we although i love the idea of reusing but it does change elevation which we we typically do not. Um, I think do. the applicant stated that I mean, we, we've permitted on projects before, and, and staff can certainly correct me if if I'm if I'm wrong. Beyond the midpoint of the house, um, we've approved that in the past, so I, I think that it's not clear that this wouldn't be appropriate. I, I think the absence of 
a craftsperson. The guidelines don't necessarily speak to the absence of a craftsperson who can do it well. Uh, the staff inspects these and, and, and goes over them. Um, that, I, don't, I don't know that it's necessarily not allowed. Um, I, I'm, I guess, making a case that we have done it okay. beyond the midpoint of the house in the past. I see two on, am I missing one? I see two on the side. Beyond the midpoint. At the front, and then okay. so these are on the back part of the house, back part of the side facade. Oh, okay. The left side is on the back part. This left picture is on the back side of the house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then the right, yeah. the, right the right side of the photo is on the back part of the house. So the this um, is on the back. The yeah, actually, let me, let me show you the front facade. So here you can see on the front facade, there is that arched opening, yeah. and so it's the windows that are being changed are behind that arched covered porch. So nothing on the front. Nothing, nothing is changing on the front, no. Uh, Dave, I'd like to just say your mother would love that kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I, unless the staff can direct me otherwise, I, I think we've permitted that in in, um, in other cases, and, and, and I feel the competency of this applicant certainly doesn't give us reason to think that, that it couldn't be accomplished, that the windows are going to be the original to the house and are going to be reused to create this opening. Um, you know, the sill fits, the jack arch fits, tooth and back in the stone. Um, it can be done. It's done on my, my folks' house, so I, and I think there are still all the few and far between there. There are crafts people that can accomplish that. Okay, go ahead and do that motion, Ben. Um, I'll move approval of 215 Mayfair Road um, with staff recommendation, with the exception that the um, as drawn inset of, of 12 inches. Um, above the water table is uh, in compliance with uh, the um, previous position uh, for a, 12, a one foot inset from, from the back and that uh, that only is encroached upon, you know, below the, the water table as exhibited in the, the applicant's drawings um, and that the window openings, um, because they're behind the midpoint of the existing house and, and also that um, the stone nature of the house, that the, the reuse of those windows will be from things that exist on the house, and so that, that getting those back in and having it look appropriate um, for the renovation would be is, uh, would be uh, able to be approved by this commission. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second. Do we have any more discussion before? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. So we, uh, we're not going to have the CO training this time. We're going to um, wait till we have a couple more people in attendance. Uh, is there anything else that um, we need to bring up, Robin? Okay, meeting adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.